have time or are we starting? We're starting. Hi. Good evening and welcome to the March 14, 2018 Civil Service Commission meeting. Maybe I have roll call, please. Commissioner Manukian? Who? Manukian? Oh, here. Commissioner Gazarian? Here. Commissioner Devine? Here. Chair Karian? Here. For the record, Commissioner McCarley is absent. What's next? Minutes for the meeting of February 28, 2018. Move to approve. Second. second. Move in a second. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Manukian? Yes. Commissioner Gazarian? Yes. Commissioner Devine? Yes. Chair of Karen? Yes. Text? Oral communications? I don't have any cards. What's next? Recruitment and examination report. So go ahead. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this is our monthly recruitment uh, status report. These are all the examinations uh, processes that have either have requisitions or uh, approvals to proceed. The number currently is 58. The report shows our recruitments, the staff assigned, the department, uh, whether the position is open, promotional, filing periods, and dates. If you have uh, any questions about any of these exams, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Otherwise, this is a note and file item. Any questions? No question. What's next? Eligibility established. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this item uh, is the uh, eligible list that have been established since our last uh, meeting. As I always say, this is the, uh, the eligibility list. It's the culmination of our recruitment process. This report shows uh, the list that have been established, the total number of applicants, and the total number that make it through the process, through all the testing phases, to appear on the list. Um, once again, this is a note and file item, but if you have questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them for you. Any questions? No questions. Next. Class specifications for approval, integrated waste collection series, and integrated waste management supervisory series. Mr. Dillard. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this uh, item is uh, revisions to the integrated waste collection series and the integrated waste supervisory series. Um, it's been about eight years since these uh, specifications have been revised and updated. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in the, in the industry, a lot of competition with private haulers, and it's been challenging to stay competitive in this uh, in this environment. Um, really, uh, the, the biggest revisions uh, with regard to, to these two series is uh, in the integrated waste collection series, we're adding a, uh, a senior truck operator a classification. And this is a little bit of a career path move for individuals in this line of work for the more sort of more experienced, more skilled, more skilled drivers, um, career opportunities, which is always a good thing. Um, individuals in this in this classification will be act as lead workers. They'll do some training and assist the uh, with the assigning of routes and, and such, and with a heavy focus on safety. Um, in the other series, the supervisory series, while it looks like what we're doing, uh, what the department is uh, doing, is adding two new classifications, they're actually replacing two higher level but upper management classifications, the uh, administrator and assistant administrator, which are really no longer needed. And they're replacing those with a more field or operational level supervisors. This is really where uh, most of the work is, is done in the, uh, in the refuse collection business. And um, again, it would uh, be a senior integrated waste supervisor and then an integrated waste uh, superintendent. Those are the two new classifications being established with this revision. Uh, if you have any questions about this item, this does require commission action. Uh, we have uh, uh, Chris Maccarello, who is the assistant public works director. He's overseeing integrated waste management currently and uh, Ando Vardanian from my staff, they're here if you have questions. Any questions? Oh, questions. Commissioner Gazzari. Yes, Mr. Doyle, you, uh, you have indicated that the GMA and the GCEA uh, were provided with an opportunity to review the proposed changes. I take it they have expressed no concerns? That is correct. Thank you. Any motion? Move to approve. Second. Move in a second. Can we have roll call, please? Commissioner Manukian? Yes. Commissioner Gazarian? Yes. Commissioner Devine? Yes. Chair of Carrion? Yes. What's next? Job bulletin for approval. Fire engineer. Mr. Doe. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this is uh, a job bulletin for approval for the position of fire engineer within the fire department. 
because this is a sworn safety promotional position, that a civil service uh, approval is required for this bulletin. Um, this bulletin is fully consistent with the approved class specification. Um, it will have uh, uh, the exact same examination components as in previous administrations, really no changes to anything involving the uh, administration of this exam. And I'll, I'll point out, as I have before, this is one of the more challenging uh, processes uh, in the whole city. Uh, candidates for fire engineer are run through uh, typically a written exam, and then they have uh, uh, four uh, practical uh, components, a pre-check of the apparatus, uh, hydrant uh, examination, uh, they have to operate an aerial ladder truck with the, the ladder and also uh, a driving exercise. Uh, candidates have to pass all of those, uh, all of those uh, uh, iterations in order to earn a spot on the list. So uh, very challenging. So with that, uh, I present this for your approval. Um, I believe we have officials from the fire department here and Ms. Hunani and from my staff who worked on this, this item. Any comments or questions? Any motions? Move to approve. Second. And a second. Can we have roll call, please? Commissioner Manukin? Yes. Commissioner Gazarian? Yes. Commissioner Devine? Yes. Chair Upkarian? Yes. What's next? Glendale Police Department demographics and recruiting presentation. Um, Mr. Doyle, go ahead. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, in August uh, 2017, the commission requested information regarding recent hiring trends in the police department, including the use of specific police officer recruit processes that focused on individuals with bilingual abilities, as well as the, the general police officer recruit uh, uh, process. This item was brought back in November 2017, and the commission requested additional data, not only on the recent recruitment and hiring and ethnic and gender data, but also on the makeup of the police department as a whole. Um, the information requested demographic uh, data at the various ranks within the department. Um, information gathered for this report was obtained through a variety of sources, both within the department and within the city's various uh, uh, record keeping systems. Uh, very challenging, but we were able to extract some data uh, that uh, we think is beneficial for uh, review by the commission. Overall, we believe this data is an accurate uh, representation of the workforce and some of our hiring trends. Um, you know, the data is, is what it is uh, from the standpoint of uh, attaining a diverse workforce that is reflective of the community. Um, there are some positive trends, but clearly a lot of work uh, that needs to be done. And this all within the context of a profession, which I would say is uh, probably the most challenging uh, uh, hiring process, hiring environment uh, that I've ever seen in my close to 30 years of uh, this business. Um, with that, uh, I was going to go ahead and introduce uh, Sean Chavez from my staff, who'd go through the, uh, the uh, uh, presentation. However, if, uh, if members of the commission wish to comment before we do that, uh, I'd be happy to refer that back to you. Yes, I'd like to comment. Uh, Commissioner Gazarian. Uh, thank you, Chair Abkarian. Um, First of all, uh, I see a lot of uh, officers here, and I welcome each and every one of you. Uh, it'd be nice to have you here every time we meet. <laughs> um, but I have a feeling that your presence uh, is born out of a concern that uh, frankly compels me to address, uh, particularly in light of having earlier today received a copy of an email that was sent to you and your colleagues on the police department. Uh, for the record, uh, I was here in August, but also for the record, I was not here in November. Uh, so I listened to the November uh, commission meeting this afternoon, put aside my professional uh, engagements, and I listened to it in its entirety. What I heard were my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Devine, Commissioner McCarley, who is not present, uh, and uh, followed by Chair Abkarian, uh, jointly asking uh, for the report that appears to be here today. There were certain things 
that I was looking carefully to see if it was in that meeting that I did not see. And so I decided as a result, for the first time in maybe six years that I have served on this commission, to actually put my thoughts on paper. Because um, I want the record to be clear about this. So Chair Abkarian, uh, Chief Examiner Doyle, Ms. Barbetian, staff, and fellow police officers here, and all others who are present, and everybody that's watching on television. Uh, if this is a meeting and an agenda item uh, which has as its subject about lowering standards, you can count me out. Me too. So, so when I read the email from the president of the GPOA, uh, I was alarmed as, as that email was alarming because it expressed a genuine concern about lowering standards. I recall very vividly uh, from this very commission a while back when staff brought a request for our approval of a civilian commander that I particularly had a problem with that classification because it contained a paragraph that said the civilian commander may act in the capacity of the police chief in the police chief's absence. I had a problem with that, because I figured how could a civilian act in the, in the role of a sworn uh, police officer who has risen through the ranks and become chief. Uh, so I don't know where the lowering of the standards concern came from. Uh, I gotta say, uh, you know, demographics are demographics, diversity is diversity, but Standards are standards, and standards, uh, if anything, perhaps uh, call for making them st more stringent, but not less stringent. Uh, I I've been a resident of this city for 26 years. Uh, I have known many uh, within the police department in a personal capacity for about 27, 28 years. Uh, I recall vividly uh, this very police department giving me my first public speaking engagement on March 22nd, 1996 under Chief Anthony. I recall joining your colleagues on March 23rd, the next day, 1996 at Elks Lodge at a CNOA conference as one of the presenters within the ranks and the contingent of the Glendale Police Department. At no time uh, have I thought that this department was allowing people in or keeping people out uh, and fudging with standards. Last time I checked, every one of you is supposed to be carrying or pulling the same 154 pounds or whatever the weight of that dummy is that you're supposed to be pulling and climbing the same wall and, and taking the same written exam, the same oral exam and, and, and all the other stuff. Uh, but nothing is more telling to me than my very presence on this commission. My very presence on this commission, I owe to the nomination of someone by the name of Paula Devine, not someone whose last name ends with an I-A-N. And Commissioner McCarley, who sits over there, he owes his appointment to the nomination of someone whose name is Aaron Nigerian, whose name does end with an I-A-N. So, at no point in time have I sensed that this commission is in the business of lowering standards to allow a particular segment of the community to gain uh, a badge and a gun and a uniform. I hope that is still the case. I last checked, it appeared to be the case in the, uh, in the minutes as well as the video that I watched uh, earlier this afternoon. So, what I'm really more interested in hearing about today, and I'm glad to see our uh, Chief Povolaitis here and, and, and command staff. Uh, what I'm really more interested in hearing is about the processes by which qualified officers uh, rise to the rank of sergeant and qualified sergeants rise to the rank of lieutenant, 
and qualified lieutenants rise to the rank of captain. Now, I could say I'd like to see, you know, how our chiefs of police are selected over the course of years, but that's the province of city council, and, and I have every full faith and confidence that uh, the decisions that are made uh, are made with the best of good faith and the best of intentions. Uh, so whether there's 300 police officers uh, that contain three Hispanics and one African American or contain uh, 130 Hispanics and 100 African Americans, to me, as a citizen of the city of Glendale, when I seek the assistance of a police officer, I seek the assistance of the police officer and I don't stop to think, wait a minute, what's your ethnic background? No, I don't want your help, I'd rather, I'd rather die here, no. Uh, and when I seek the assistance of police officer in stopping crime, I seek the assistance of the best of police officers. Why do I seek the assistance of the best of police officers? Because by my, by my profession as being a defense attorney, nothing, nothing pains me more when a police officer has not achieved his or her best. Because when the police officer has not achieved his or her best, it opens the door for me to do whatever it is I need to do in my zealous advocacy for my client. So I don't know where the concerns have come from that has uh, caused the sending of an email that when I read it, I see the concern, but when I look at the entirety of the situation that has brought us to this evening, uh, I'm, a bit of a, I'm a bit at a loss. Uh, there, are certain, there are certain comments here in the email that I am certain that the president of the GPOA will, will put those who have had concerns the last maybe 12 hours uh, at ease, at ease and explain why the email uses phrase, phrases such as this group. I don't know which group that is referenced to. Uh, it makes references to certain commissioners. I don't know what commissioners it is referring to. Uh, it talks about lowering of our standards and, and wanting to uh, maintain the highest standards for the police department. I couldn't agree more, but but I am at the same time worried, worried that someone who heads the GPOA is worried. So uh, I really am looking forward to a healthy dialogue because I do not, uh, I do not understand when I read these types of issues can affect the future of this great organization and shouldn't be taken lightly. I don't know what is meant by these types of issues. And I don't know what the word future means when writing these types of issues can affect the future of this great organization. This was, folks, a discussion about, uh, about hiring practices, I suppose. This was a discussion about hiring practices vis-a-vis -vis demographics. Uh, I don't care if a particular segment of the City of Glendale is made up of 48% of one ethnic uh, origin versus 12% is made up of another. And I really don't think that if one particular segment of, the, of this city is made up of 48% of one ethnicity, that it means necessarily that there ought to be 48% of the police force representing exactly that ethnic community. That's not what I mean, that's not what I ever expect. But what I do expect is a diverse police force because a diverse police force uh, will make the police force stronger. Because if you have one or two or three or four or five from a particular ethnic community, they will educate the other 200 as to the particulars and the nuances and it will make everybody collectively that much more uh, in tune, aware and knowledgeable. And knowledge in the end, ladies and gentlemen, is power. So beyond that, which I, think, which I think the city does uh, and the department does appear to have that, although I note that uh, the African-American component has, has dropped uh, by 100% and, uh, and certain components uh, have not really risen much. I, I'm not aware if the demographics of the city have changed much uh, in the period of time that uh, this report seems to be addressing, going back about 10 years. Uh, but. Uh, 
Chair Abkarian, without taking uh, any more time, uh, I, will, I will remind my fellow commissioners that at the November meeting, Sean Chavez was here, uh, Mania Hunanian, according to the record, was here, so was Chief Carl Povalaitis, and so, were, so was Lieutenant Gilkerson. And I recall having just viewed the, uh, the hearing, Commissioner Devine talking about disbursements by ethnicity, hiring, promotion by rank, sergeant, lieutenant, etc. And I also uh, uh, heard with great interest uh, my fellow Commissioner McCarley uh, questioning whether or not the tests were inappropriate uh, uh, or too specific or too hard. But nowhere did I hear Commissioner McCarley speaking about let's, let's make the tests easier for one particular segment of our population versus another. Uh, so uh, the question was, do we have the same failure rates? Uh, and um, and the address uh, the the addressees uh, the addressees were you know th there was a comment about well you know there was a standard of somebody had to be five foot eleven inches or else uh, and there were factors of yesteryear's uh, compared to today's uh, standards uh, and and finally uh, Sean Chavez shared with this commission in my absence that there was a fifty percent pass rate. And, and that the English Armenian demographic was a bit lower, uh, but the English Korean demographic was about 50%. And everybody here, uh, except me who was absent, agreed to ask for this greater report. Uh, I, I, I wait with bated breath to hear what the concerns are, because if there are any concerns by the GPOA, it will be taken seriously by me, and I'm certainly it will be taken seriously by anybody else on this commission. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Commissioner Manukian. Um, first of all, I like I, uh, everything you said, I agree with you 100%. Um, one of the things that this community is blessed, is blessed because of our first responders. Um, there are times that I easily go back to my office at 11 o'clock at night because I know if God forbid something happens, one phone call away, um, you guys will be there. Doesn't matter who shows up, what last name they have. I know for a fact, whatever, whoever shows up, they will be one of the members of the best law enforcement in this country, without a doubt. Um, and and um, we are all very proud of you guys. We. I have also gone back and looked at the tape. There was never a discussion of any standards being lowered. Um, I've always said, so have all of our commissioners on this side. These are non-negotiable items. Quality is non-negotiable, and, and the qualifications are non-negotiable. Now, if we can review a process, and if there is, at the end of the day, something wrong with it, we can address it. But Never have I heard a single commissioner on this dais ever talk about bringing our standards down because it's not gonna get far, even if it does come up. So um, one thing that I can say is thank you. Thank you for everything you guys do and thank you for who you are and, and, and the, we, you have spoiled us in the sense of this residence giving this, the quality of representation that we do have. And uh, I'm very open to hearing what the report has to say but that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And I am quite pleased that we have so many in attendance at a commission meeting, which is on most occasions completely forsaken and forgotten. So we must have something of great interest to those who are participating, the members of our law enforcement our great police department, fire department, other civil servants, and interested members of the community. Uh, when we embarked upon this process, and as I've explained to some, there's an old adage I learned in my experience, uh, both as a um, integrated member of the federal government and as well a member of a law enforcement agency. First and most important thing, when you look to improve, it's called the Dimaic 
It means you got to figure out what the problem is. Assuming we have a problem, we're not sure if we have a problem. The next thing is to measure. And that's what we asked the HR department to do, to across the board, give us some statistics. If, in fact, there's something to be interpreted or gained from the, the statistics, the data that is in front of us and shared with, with you all, then perhaps we analyze it. It's our responsibility to analyze it. And if there's an opportunity to improve whatever that improvement might be, then we would suggest improvements to the council and thereafter uh, continue to monitor those improvements, as is our responsibility under the charter. But all we've done so far is we've gotten uh, data. And this is extremely valuable. Again, <laughs> express appreciation to uh, Matt Doyle and his team and uh, the um, Glendale Police Department and the GPOA for assisting in this process. But I'll say on my part that there never was and never will be on my part an intent to modify, reduce, or change standards because when you're out in the field, you want that police officer or that uh, member of our fire department to have the exact, have the same capabilities, the same commitment to service, the, tra the same training and experience so that you rely upon him or her to do the right thing, stand by your side, regardless of the risk to life and injury. So never, never, at least while I'm on my watch, will there be any mitigation of standards. Any other comments? Well, I certainly echo my colleagues. Uh, I think it's well put. And uh, I think at this point, uh, what I would like to see is two things. Number one, that we hear the report, have Mr. Uh, or Chief Provolitis uh, tell us about the report, the findings, uh, what his thoughts are about it, and what recommendations he may have. And then secondly, and I think just as important, I would like to hear from the representative of the group, the GPOA, to find out exactly what their concerns are, uh, rather than you know reading in a email kind of nebulous thoughts and ideas. I'd like to find out exactly what uh, we can do to make this better or fix or whatever. So I would suggest, uh, Mr. Chair, that we have those two presentations, one from Mr. Uh, yeah. Chief Provolitis and one from the spokesperson for these officers. Now, there, there is an actual presentation that you were going to go through? Is yes, that sir. what it was? Yes. Okay, so why don't we have that first, because they spend time putting the numbers together and doing a presentation. Let's do that first, and then uh, we'll get to Chief Provolitis on his comments, and then the GPOA uh, for theirs. Uh, so what are we, who is going to do the presentation, Matt? This is uh, Sean Chavez, Human Resources Analyst. He's currently assigned to Police Department uh, to assist with their recruitments. So. How, long is the, how long is the report? Of course. It is the, re it's the report that you see here in your packets. I, I, I promise I'll turn it over to Sean Chavez because he actually did some uh, yeoman's work on kind of putting the data together. Uh, I think you all of you may have stolen, I'm sorry, Carl Povelitis, Interim Police Chief. I think all of you may have stolen a, a little bit of my thunder and some comments, but I thought if I might, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to set a little bit of context and maybe talk to you a little bit about some of the things that keep me up at night. Because uh, we do face challenges as an organization, and I think, uh, and, and one of those challenges, and one of the big ones, and I'll tell you what, it actually does keep me up at night, is, uh, is recruiting. And so with those challenges also come some great opportunities. As I said, in a moment, you'll get a chance to look at the demographics, but I want to set a little bit of context, I think, of a, a police organization, because I think a lot of people look at organizations, we look at a modern generation that's very used to changing jobs, and you know, <coughs> the organization asks how long somebody's been somewhere, and it's a relatively short period of time. Every time that we hire somebody for a police department, we really anticipate that they will be with us for 20 or 30 years. So you're looking at me, <laughs> and it said, the dinosaur scale, go down the back. I've been here 27 years. If you look at my command staff, they've also, well, one was hired in the, 19, in the late 1980s, but we're all, you know, sort of the vintage of the 90s. This is a very difficult job, and it is not a job that can be done by everybody. 
there are a lot of people who want to do this job, but when you look at the number of tasks that are asked of a police officer, the amount of time in which they have to make that decision, we are looking for a very, very unique individual. We are looking for someone who at some points, as I said, as, as I'll get some slings and arrows here, uh, that at some, point, some points can be a social worker, but we're also looking for people who can deal with tactical situations and know when to flip that switch, you know, from, as I said, handling someone who's the victim of a crime with kid gloves to being able to, in the next moment, walk into either, you know, God, God forbid, a school or kind of the robbery this weekend that a lot of people thought on social media was an active shooter, and our entire department is responding to that. So I gotta tell you, I gotta hire the best and the brightest. And I'm also gonna tell you, I'm very proud of this organization and having been here for 27 years. Um, we do hire the best and the brightest. We have one of the safest communities, and that is in many, in many ways a credit to the men and women who work here, but it's also a credit to this community and the partnerships uh, that we develop and our ability to get together, and we do this and as I said, I always like to do this because I compare myself to the city of Los Angeles. We do this on a per capita basis with half the officers that the city of Los Angeles does per capita. We have hung around 1.2 for as long as I've been here. The city of LA is at 2.4. And so just to kind of paint the picture for the type of organization that we are, I mean, it is lean, it is mean, and it is very effective um, and very customer friendly. Be careful with the mean part, I guess. Um, and it for is, people it who is, don't know what those ratios are. If you yeah, know. so so if in other in other words, to, if, uh, to compare ourselves to the city of Los Angeles, you would have to double the size of the Glendale Police Department today. That's how many police officers, you know, per unit population. We, you know, we have half of that. We have 244 authorized sworn positions. If we were the city of Los Angeles, you would see double that number here. Yet we have a crime rate that is much lower than the city of, uh, than the city of Los Angeles. But it's a, it is a very difficult job. I need to hire the best and the brightest. I will tell you, and I think all the men and the women, women of the Glendale Police Department will agree, we need a diverse department. It helps us do our job that much better. It is language skills, it is understanding culture, it is educating each other. This is a team environment. I have said many times to people individually and others, it's like if, if everybody here was a narcotics officer, we would not be a very good police department. We need people with business skills, we need people with computer skills, we need people with language skills, we need people who are tacticians, we need people who can go and work with the community. This truly is a, uh, is a, team, is a team effort. But I gotta tell you, we have a hard time finding qualified candidates any qualified candidates. Right now, I have seven vacancies for police officers. I anticipate that we'll have about 18 retirements this year. We have to hire that many people just to keep up. I expect we'll have an equal number of retirements the following year. And it's not just our, uh, our sworn ranks, which seems to be mostly the topic of the discussion that we'll get into today, but it also impacts our professional staff and our dispatchers. And at the same time, you, I, will, I will comment some more when you want to talk about ideas and we talk about the demographics, but I think you'll see an organization that has been changing over time. And I think as we talk about, we'll talk about a little bit about short-term strategies and long-term strategies as to how to get where we need to go. Some of the short-terms are what we do to hire immediately, but I think you'll see that we have also put in place some long-term strategies because the way we're probably going to do this in the long haul is we're gonna to have to grow our own. We're gonna to have to look within within our own community and we're having to have to work early and bring those people along and have them join our organization. And I said, I look forward to kind of, of, of having, having take a look at this. With that, as I said, I hope that sets a little bit of context of, of, what, we're, of what we're doing. Because I said, I do lose sleep at night over how it is we are going to hire. And I said, I think, although that's a challenge, it also brings a great, a great amount of opportunity because I'll tell you right now, and I've told my staff, I don't have the lock on ideas on how to do this. And so if there's a place we need to be, if there are good people that we can, that we can pick up, that can do it. But I gotta tell you, uh, competence is not negotiable. You all have it exactly right. When you call 911 and somebody shows up in that Glendale PD uniform with the patches on the shoulder and the badge on the chest, you, need, you want the confidence that they're doing what, th that they know what they're doing. And I gotta tell you, that's exactly where we've been for my career here. And that's where I expect we'll be going forward, is we are looking for the best and the brightest of everybody that this community has to offer, all quadrants, all cultures. And so, as I said, with that, let me turn that over to Sean, if I may, and he can work through the... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Chief. Uh, I think uh, uh, Commissioner no, I just wanted to make, I just wanted to make a comment uh, based on what you just said. Um, this is how badly you guys have spoiled us, that over the weekend when that uh, attempted robbery was being announced, I hear my wife laughing. I go, why are you laughing? She goes, what a moron. You think you're gonna come to Glendale? and commit a robbery and get away with it, that's truly the, 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 and it's a reflection of what you guys do. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think, I think, Mr. Chavez, before you actually get started, let me hear from a GPOA because I think that would be important, and then we'll go to the presentation. Sorry about that. We'll get to you. Don't worry. You've worked hard on this. Good evening, Sorry. Commission, uh, Chairman and, and Commissioners. Um, my name is Ben Bateman. I'm the President of the Glendale Police Officer Association. I'm up here with Jason Ross. He's my uh, Vice President. Um, some of the issues that the email that I sent out to our membership um, was commented on, and I'm happy to sit here in these chambers today and hear the commission um, support maintaining the standards and making sure that we hire the highest quality people into our uh, police department. The goal of the GPOA is to make sure that everybody that works here is the best quality that we can be, providing the best customer service to the community here, um, and doing that uh, as effectively as we can. Um, one of the things that prompted this, though, just to, to give you a little bit of, of background, when I didn't attend the, the November uh, commission meeting, um, but I did watch it, and I did hear some of the questions regarding the analysis that staff did into the results of the tests and stuff. And those things prompted me to uh, listen and, and look at what was implied if it wasn't specifically stated. Uh, Commissioner Gazzari, you, you said that you didn't hear anything like that, but some of the stuff that I heard or the way that I heard it was that maybe we need to look at these tests and maybe the tests are too difficult. Uh, the inference from a test being too difficult is that maybe then we might have to look at making the test a little bit easier. And that was the inference that I understood that was made uh, on the comments that were generated. Um, I have. As you can see, a lot of uh, Glendale uh, POA members here, all of our association or a good representation of our membership is here, um, and the very diverse group that goes out on the streets every day and every night to protect the, the community here. And I think it's very, very important um, that we maintain and, and give everybody that uh, has come through the ranks, that's come to this level, uh, the, the satisfaction to know that that's the standard that we're setting and that's the standard that we're going to maintain and that we aren't gonna change that uh, for any reason as long as we get the highest quality, uh, best uh, applicants through here. We're gonna have the highest quality people that are working for our agency, and we're gonna be able to provide the highest level of customer service at, uh, to the community, which is our most important uh, fact. Uh, Jason had a couple comments. If you want some detail um, in regards to, uh, you know, I think the November meeting and what was said or how maybe I interpreted it, um, that might be the basis for uh, me creating that letter to have my members show up today. Good evening, Commission. Uh, I went through the video uh, several times and some of our members watched it because it was available online and uh, knew that this interpretation of the email may come up tonight. And uh, in looking at the, the video from the November meeting, uh, which caused some concern with our members. Uh, and normally our, our members don't reach out to us about a civil service commission meeting or what they've heard or the rumors they're hearing in the community or those things. You guys made the headlines. Uh, some I of, was some, absent. I, I know. And, and, and That's probably why you made the I, was, yeah. I was gonna give you a pass here because I don't have any quotes from you uh -huh. uh, as a result, but uh, some, of, some of the quotes that were made um, unfortunately took place in a meeting that also dealt with ethnicity. And the, the, the discussion was commingled at times between recruitment and eth ethnic makeup and demographics of the department and hiring standards. Several different issues commingled together make a, a very dangerous recipe. Uh, but some of the quotes we heard were, uh, so the interesting question is, there's, is there something here that suggests perhaps the tests are inappropriate? The tests are either too difficult or too hard. Um, because these are data points. Data can become knowledge from which we can derive perhaps amendments to our regulations. Uh, if we see disparities, significant deviations between those populations and the general population that suggests something, oh, excuse me, that suggests something. It could be, for instance, that the PAT is too rigorous. Uh, we heard from Commissioner Devine, uh, what I would be more interested in is seeing is the disbursement by ethnicity throughout the department in terms of hiring and promotions and actually see, I guess you'd call it by rank to see the disbursement of ethnicity throughout the department so we can see the hiring and promotional trends within the department. Uh, Chair Abkarian said, uh, I believe that the department, and this is to his credit, I believe that the department is doing or is trying to do what they can to, do, to recruit a diverse as they can within the city. So I don't have too much, too much problem, and I'm pretty confident in that and your department. Uh, but then he went on to say, 
Uh, that concerns me, not so much that the police department is not hiring Armenians, but that the human resources might consider other options or alternatives. Uh, I think there's a fundamental issue here. Whatever approach we are taking for the past 20 years isn't working. Uh, and to Chair, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Manukian's credit, uh, and it was music to our ears, uh, and it's what resonates with our members, is that at the end of the day, he said, for me, the most important thing is the most qualified person gets hired. That's not negotiable. Uh, the discussion on demographics and uh, putting all of us into a category uh, is something that, that strikes deep. It's something that our department has wounds that haven't healed from from recent years where there have been allegations of mistreatment within the agency. We saw how that played out in federal court. Uh, and what you see here behind us may appear to you to be a pretty diverse workforce, but when I turn around and, and Ben turns around and these guys look at each other, we're all blue. That's it. So when we hear discussion about uh, pass fail or whatever, knowing that the chief is gonna have to struggle to fill 40 something positions in the next two years because of retirement, and we hear discussion about why are people failing out, our concern is that the, the people that come in and fill these ranks, that frankly, it's a convenience for you when you call 911 that we're there, but every single day we, we rely on each other to save each other's lives. That the odds are far better that any one of these guys out here is gonna have a role in saving my life or vice versa than anybody else in the community because we, we have each other's back. And so when we hear these discussions taking place, mixing demographics and ethnicity and some statistical representation of who we are, we're not a statistical representation. We're the best of the best that are proud to work at an agency that values what we do for the community. And when our members see a commission meeting going down this road where they don't want to be seen as a member of one group or a member of another group. They wanna be treated fairly and, and have that's what we've always sought to have in the agency. They wanna be treated the same as everybody else, but they can't live that life. They can't have that because there are discussions taking place beyond their control that stem from politics and local political pressures and things like that that force them to be viewed a little differently even before this commission as a demographical stat. That's where our members are concerned with. That's where they're coming from. That's how they brought us these concerns hearing the discussion about processes and PATs and pass-fail rates on these things, these are all concerns. I wish more people passed. LAPD just got authorization to hire 3,000 more officers because of the Olympics. We've gotta compete with that to fill 40-something spots. Not to say that we compete with LAPD for candidates, but that's something we're faced with. And there, there are challenges in hiring and filling these ranks that the only thing these members care about is that they're as competent as we are and that we continue the tradition that the Glendale Police Department has, which is providing the best police in the area, the best policing services in the state of California, perhaps, maybe the nation. We're very proud of what we do. Th these were their concerns that caused us to send an email because this discussion got commingled with a number of things and the statements from the, the commissioners, we interpret a certain way, you interpret our email a certain way th when things get interpreted. They're open to uh, interpretation and people's opinions and biases play into how they read things or whatever. Reading something in writing, hearing the discussion that's taking place, people come away from it with a different feeling or a different emotional response. The response that we have tonight is that our members heard this discussion, they heard about it taking place, it generated some discussion amongst them. They approached us. There, there's people back here that have heard about these things taking place in the community, pressure to do things with diversity and other things. And these frankly are, are, are not our concern. The concern is that we hire competent people, we replace the officers that are retiring with the best that are out there, and nothing short of that. And that's music to our ears to hear. I truly believe that the commissioners up here appreciate the services offered by every single member of our department when they call 911, and I believe that. Uh, but unfortunately, the way the discussion took place at the November meeting, it, it caused some feathers to be ruffled and some concern to be uh, had by our members. And as a result, we thought, well, if this, decision, this discussion is gonna take place, we're the guardians of fairness the Civil Service Commission, whose sole responsibility is to ensure that these other characteristics have no part in the hiring process, have started down a, a road on discussion with demographics that it doesn't impact the hiring process. That's why we're here. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, because I, all the commissioners made a statement, uh, I would like to also make a statement before we actually get to the um, presentation itself. Um, first, I make no excuses for being an Armenian American. That's what I am. The same way as not an Irish American doesn't make excuses for being an Irish American. And I make no excuses for saying that in a city where 50% of the population is Armenian, that we should try other options of trying to get more Koreans, more Armenians, 
and more ethnic groups involved, including females, involved in the police department. I make no excuses for saying that, and I stand by it every day. Uh, however, I don't think that saying, let's hire Armenians, Koreans, or Hispanics, or females, equals lowering the standards in no way, shape, or form. I wouldn't support it. In fact, I think it's raising the standards as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so uh, I believe, I understand the content of the email now makes more sense after the discussion by the GPOA. I think it makes more sense uh, putting two and two together. But at the same time, I, th I stand by what I said in November and I'll say it again. We need to look at different alternatives and options to try to recruit a more diverse police department. I have, uh, you know, uh, we, I was in a TV show with uh, Interim Chief Povolitis and Captain Gilkerson where we actually, oh, I said Captain, uh, I already promoted you there. Uh, <laughs> take the promotion, you take the increase in pay. Uh, where we discussed uh, uh, a different, different attitude, different options and going to different organizations, doing different things for, the, for us to be able to reach to the uh, ethnic communities. But at the same time, in no way, shape, or form do I support affirmative action I, or support quota system. I do support looking at all kinds of different options to try to bring in as diverse of a force as we possibly can to the city. And I will, until I'm in the Civil Service Commission, uh, as long as uh, the city council wants me to, uh, I will push for that idea. But I will never push for an idea of lowering standards so we can hire from a particular ethnic group, uh, Armenian be included in that. But I don't, again, believe, I believe that there are plenty of candidates within the, within the community that just don't know how great this police department is, what, the, what they offer, what they do. And if I felt in any way, shape, or form scared or uncomfortable or um, not protected by the police department, I wouldn't live in this city. I've been in this city for 38 years. My kids are going to live here for another 38. So this is the department that, and a place that I've chosen to be my home. Uh, and as such, I want to make sure that it actually represents my home. Um, you say that you bleed blue. Uh, every time you make a stop, it's a dangerous job. I mean, this is a job that not too many parents want their kids to, to have. And I understand that. Uh, but at the same time, again, the discussion had revolved around what other alternatives could we have to try to attract people in the community that more, uh, to bring more diversity to the force. And I stand by it. I say that I won't back from it but I'm in no way, shape, or form in favor of lowering standards so we can get those people. But I believe that there are people in this, in this city that, that meet those standards, if not exceeded, that could be a part of this force. And that's all we, our discussion was. And I don't think our discussion ever, ever went anywhere in lowering the standard. And if there was a misunderstanding of what the commission said, and I think I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna talk on behalf of all of my commissioners, where, where I say that at no time was there an intent by this commission or anyone associated with this commission to lower any standards so we can attract whoever we're going to attract. The discussion was let's get more qualified people in the community and what are the other alternatives that we haven't tried in the past 20 years to achieve that goal. And that's all really the, the issue was. And I appreciate your concern and your, your statements here because it really clarifies a lot of issues having to do with the email that was sent out. If there's no other comment, I would like to ask uh, the presentation to be given to us. Uh, uh, Mr. Commissioner there is. Uh, Gazarian. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, President Ben Bateman and Vice President Jason Ross for your remarks. Uh, it puts in proper context the email which I read, which was really subject to multiple interpretations, and it caused me a great deal of grief for, for the entire day. Uh, but I did not deem it appropriate for me to reach out to you uh, in the interim. So I struggled with it. 
and I did watch that videotape, and I understand how you would, Mr. Bateman, uh, view certain comments as perhaps an inclination to reduce standards. I just know my fellow commissioners perhaps a bit better than you, um, having spent considerable amount of time with these folks. Uh, I know their character and their sense of scrutinizing things uh, more for higher standards than lower standards. Uh, I'm glad that I believe we have the same objective and no other objective. Uh, and with that, I ask the one question that the opportunity presents itself. Mm -hmm. And the question is this to either one of you. Do you think that the current standards as they are in place have produced um, your fellow uh, brothers and sisters in arms well? Or do you think that those standards should be viewed by this commission to be made even more stringent? Because I say this. Um, because Chief Povolaitis, one of the reasons why I respect the chief is because he's rather transparent uh, with us. He's transparent in the sense that, see, no side talk. When, when he disagrees with me, he tells me he disagrees with me. Uh, and that's why I respect someone. When they disagree with you, they can tell you their disagreement and the basis for their disagreement. We can all agree to disagree so long as we agree on one thing, that our objective is to have the safest city, and the safest city can only be had by the most qualified police department, my most qualified police force. So how are the standards? Commissioner, again, um, I think that the standards that the Glendale Police Department uh, sets are high standards. I believe that every one of these people uh, behind me um, got to this position by the challenge of becoming a Glendale police officer, and it was a challenge for every single one of us when we did it, whether it was some of these guys one or two years ago or 25 or more years ago. Um, uh, I think that the standards are, are good standards that produce high quality police, police officers to police our community. I think that attracting those high quality people is our biggest challenge, and I think that's what I'm hearing from the from the commission here today. I think that you know the, the fact that our pay sometimes has slipped in the standings that we got down to a, a rating a 10 in, the, in our comparable cities, I think those things are things that we need to look at in an effort to make sure that we're attracting the highest quality people, the more, most qualified candidate. Because it's possible that a lot of the people right here in our own community are going to other agencies. They're going to agencies that might pay better or offer a, a better benefits package because this is such a, a, a challenging time for law enforcement and there's such a demand for high quality people. And our goal, just like yours, and I'll repeat it again, is the highest quality that we can get. And I don't, I don't know that there's any, any higher standard that we need to be. We just need to make sure that we maintain our standard uh, of, of being the, a top rated agency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Carter. Mr. Chair, uh, again, to all the attendees, thank you for participating. <coughs> and we have to thank those men and women, once young, now seasoned veterans of our police department who stood up, raised their right hand, and swore to serve the people of this great city. And the problems that we're talking about get right down to recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. And the problem is systemic meaning it's not only this department it's not only lapd sheriff's department but as you s expand into those other areas in which the risk to life and limb is significant and where the credo is selfless service you don't get a lot of young men and women anymore, the best and brightest who are willing and have the courage to do what you gentlemen and you women are doing in the department. And coming from the Army, we had the exact same problem in trying to recruit those best and brightest, taking them some from you, of course, or some we sent back to you after we give them six or seven years of challenge in the United States Army or the Marine Corps or the Navy or the Air Force. Same problem. So maybe it gets back to we have to encourage our young men and women from all walks of life, cultures, ethnicities, nationalities, races, to understand that their primal commitment is to their community and one way of serving 
is to raise their right hand, serve either as a full-time or a part-time member of the Glendale Police Department. Thank you. Just a quick comment to all the associations. Even though we can meet uh, with two or three of us together at the same time, all of us, well, at least, let me say, I am open to any discussions, uh, lunches, breakfasts. If you have concern, bring it up to us uh, individually. You don't have to come to a meeting to do it. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, don't let the water, so to speak, boil and, and, and tip off. Uh, go ahead and meet with us and uh, kind of discuss this issue so we can tell you our concerns, you can tell us yours. So when we sit here to represent the community, we're representing the entire community, including the associations. Uh, uh, I, I, yes. I don't do breakfast or lunch, dinners yeah. only. Dinners so, only with okay. Carl in his house <laughs> with his wife cooking. Anytime. How's that go? Anytime. That's perfect. Okay, now we'll get to the presentation. <laughs> Good Can evening, I? Commission. Uh, my name is Sean Chavez. I'm with the uh, Human Resources Department. I'm the analyst assigned to the Glendale Police Department. And I will be presenting the demographics and recruitment activity on behalf of the Police Department. Can I, can I make a quick comment? Uh, the GPOA is heard. The membership is appreciated. Uh, I, I, we, thank you for coming here tonight. Don't get me wrong. And if any of you want to stay around and listen to a presentation, you're more than welcome to do it. But if you decide to leave, you won't offend us in any way, shape, or form. So it's up to you. If you want to stay, you can stay. If you want to leave, it's up to you. So I just wanted to bring that up so you don't feel uncomfortable if you want to get up and leave. That go means, ahead. That you means go we're ahead. no longer interested. Our crowd is going to go away. Yeah, no, I'm just the Biggest go ahead, crowd I'm we've had in a year. Go ahead. Oh. go ahead, please. I'm writing down names of people leaving. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead please. I'll see them in court. Go ahead. <laughs> oh no, that's our problem. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Sure. Okay, so the first slide here, it's, it's the most dense slide we have, I promise, but uh, the tables depicted uh, here uh, represent the demographics of the Glendale Police Department from the years 2007 to 2016. Uh, the top box shows the division of personnel within the department uh, between non-sworn and sworn, with sworn being uh, in the red font. Um, some things I, I want to point out to you. Uh, the uh, sworn Armenian population for the Glendale Police Department, you can see there. If you look in the last column, it shows the percent increase decrease from 2007 to 2016, and you can see uh, that Armenian population has risen to 64.3% six, uh, from the year 2007 to 16. Um, Asian Pacific Islander has gone up 26.7%. Uh, unfortunately, the black demographic uh, has decreased by 28.6%. Um, but I think this is mostly attributed to the, the fact that the, the number was already low to begin with, and so even if you lose one, that percentage is, is, is significant. Um, the number of Hispanic officers has gone up to uh, up 20 percent, uh, while the number of white officers has, de has declined as well. Uh, and I think this, de this decrease, as you can see, the, the number of sworn total has decreased over, over from 2007 to 16 as well, 9.9 uh, percent, 9 so I think the white uh, demographic is kind of affected by this decrease in the workforce overall. Um, so as you can see, the, the, the trend of Armenian officers, uh, Asian Pacific Islander, those um, have really benefited from our bilingual recruitments, uh, whereas I think the white uh, demographic has, has kind of gone down as a result of, of the non-targeted uh, specific recruitments in addition to just the, the um, workforce uh, decreasing uh, over time from 2007 to 16. I'll go ahead and proceed in the presentation unless there's any questions on this slide. Uh, Mr. Am, am Mr. I correct? I'm sorry. Am I correct in, in, in analyzing this, which I spent quite a bit of time, and, and concluding that 10% of our police force we have lost from 2007 on to 2016, that we had 253 sworn officers and we now only have, as of 2016, 228? If yeah, that is correct. And the population has increased, so. We, we will have to have a conversation about that, Chief. <laughs> okay, all right. Mr. Chair, if I could uh, add as well. Um, this, uh, this information, which I think is very helpful, because it shows the trend over time and where we're, we're going with some groups versus others, uh, 
Um, we are, we have been working on the demographics report and we've been presenting this report for many, many years now. And uh, in fact, I, I, I will have a, another slide uh, such as this to show you it probably uh, next, next month, but uh, um, the demographic data going back to 2003 uh, this shows the last 10 years approximately, 2007, but going back to 2003, those numbers, those increases are even more dramatic. Uh, just to kind of a sneak preview, the, uh, the increase in the Armenian sworn officers is actually 187.5% since 2003. Uh, Hispan or, I'm sorry, Asian Pacific Islander is 43.5%, uh, Hispanic 63.6%, and the decline in the uh, in the the uh, white population is about 34.3. That's since 2003. So, over time, you'll see uh, uh, these numbers change in that uh, in that direction. So. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Marco. You know, one of the comments that that I've made this comment before, <coughs> and, and I think it really applies in the the first the, the competition that we have from other cities attracting qualified applicants is only going to get worse. And a lot of this, in my opinion, has to do with, the, I mean, the ridiculous compensation that we provide for our officers to begin with. <coughs> These guys go in day in, day out, put their lives on line, and we, I mean, we think we provide a compensation? That's a joke. Uh, you know, it, how you're going to attract qualified applicants uh, to come and, and I see other cities have started this process that are making it more attractive financially for them to consider going to, you know, we have members of this community that work for LAPD. To me, that's an insult, you know? And, and, and it's happening because they're putting out the compensation that it's still not close to anywhere what these guys deserve, but I don't know where, I know we don't play a role in that, but it's only gonna get worse in time, because yeah. all of the departments are going through the same process. Commissioner, and, and Commissioner uh, Manugian, as much as I'd love to uh, write a check right now to all of them and increase their salary by 25%, uh, I don't want us to overstep oh, I didn't. Uh, our, our boundaries of what we are uh, appointed to do and start doing what uh, no, the no, elected, what elected officials are to do. So. That's not what I was proposing, right. but let's get realistic. We can sit here and talk all day. And, and but the true way of, of, of attracting qualified applicants are to first to begin to pay them what they're worth. And, and that may be a worthwhile recommendation, Chair Abkarian, for us to make if there is such a mechanism, if, the, if our uh, council tells us that we are, uh, we are empowered with making such recommendations to city council or city staff. We're not. I, I always I, I see you shaking your head. I always yeah. want to make sure that we don't overstep our boundaries. We are a commission appointed by the city council to do a job, which is to review hiring and, and review standards. We don't have an authority to make recommendation to city council. Uh, if you want to upset the city council, then we cross that line and then uh, they'll have five new commissioners <laughs> here tomorrow morning. So, uh, with that said, with, with that said, Mr. Gazarian could have breakfast and right. lunch. Uh, <coughs> with that said, let's go to the next next uh, next slide. Yeah, and I just want to also note at this time too, we do have some slides coming up that are going to talk about uh, some um, challenges the department faces in recruitment, and then also some strategies. So that will okay. also be echoed Perfect. later slide. on in the presentation. Slide, please. Uh, the next slide is uh, focused on uh, the most. Um, most recent data we could collect, so this is gonna be the 2017 demographics data for the Glendale Police Department. Uh, again, the sworn personnel um, figures are displayed in red font. In the top box, the percentage values in the last column reflect the, uh, the composition of each ethnic group uh, within the department. Uh, so for instance, the number of non-sworn Armenian personnel has, uh, is comprised of 4.97% uh, of the department as a whole. And then if you combine that number with the 23 sworn Armenian officers, the percent value of Armenian demographics is 11.33% that you can see there on the, on the bottom, bottom box. What do you mean by values and we assign 41, 29, five, is that the number of people? So, so that's, the, that's the percentage makeup of the, depart, of, the, of the department as a whole. Got it, thank you. So if there, yeah, so if there's 18, uh, 18 non-sworn Armenian personnel 
that, that comprises 4.9% of the, of the of department as a whole. And then the, the demographics totals means what? The demographic totals combines the, the sworn and non-sworn. So that way you don't have to do the math on your own. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, next please. Okay, and the next slide that follows is the 2017 gender demographics for the Glendale Police Department. Again, at the November meeting, it was mentioned that you guys were, had wanted to, to see the, the composition of uh, female and male officers, and then also we provide the non-sworn uh, non -sworn demographics as well for gender. As you can see there, uh, we have 24 female officers for the department, and then 203 male officers. You know, one thing that it'd be interesting, maybe next time we, have another column that represents just the general of the industry itself. Uh, yeah, so I can I can speak to that a little bit in, in doing some research for this. The LAPD has approximately or has 1,860 female officers, which is 18% for for LAPD, out of a total of 10,055 total officers. Uh, City of Burbank, uh, they have uh, 152 total officers. Of those, 20 or 20 are female. So. Okay, thank you. That's that was 20%. very helpful. Mr. Chair, we can are. look at other options to try to attract more female officers. All right, go ahead, Mr. Sorry. Chair. It is it is interesting to note that the non-sworn, uh, as, as we refer to them as the professional staff, is predominantly female, and this is uh, you know we often think of, of this being parking enforcement and records, but it's also uh, our DNA lab, uh, our crime uh, crime prevention. Uh, Dispatchers, jailers, uh, very, very well represented uh, by females. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, the next slide uh, is in response to uh, Commissioner Devine's request to present data on the demographics by rank in the department. So again, this is the most recent data collected as of December 2017. Uh, you can see there, uh, uh, by rank, um, the diversity in police officer and police sergeant are a lot greater than, than when you move up in the department to, uh, to the management ranks of uh, police lieutenant and police captain. And then on the bottom row uh, of ranks, we included the category of specialized assignment. Uh, the Glendale Police Department prides itself on being a department that provides many specialized assignments to meet the needs of the citizens of Glendale. Each specialized assignment requires uh, advanced training and other certifications. Uh, and these duties are performed above and beyond uh, their regular assignment. Uh, some of the specialized assignments we have listed here, uh, actually they're not listed here, uh, but they include burglary, assaults, air support, uh, the K-9 unit, and uh, school resource officers, to name a few. Uh, since a lot of these assignments are in the field services, uh, they afford the ability for uh, officers to really build community trust. As a result, the department has, has really placed a focus effort uh, to diversify these assignments to reflect the ethnic makeup of the community. Uh, so you can see there in specialized assignment, we do have uh, a, a quite a number of Armenian officers uh, that are in that category as well as, as Hispanic. And then we do have uh, a great amount of, of whites as well. We have whites in this city? I didn't Next know. <laughs> Uh, and then the other thing I want to note here too on the, uh, the last couple boxes, we have the police cadets and the police explorers listed here. It's really noteworthy to mention the, the police explorers, uh, there's 10 Armenians in that category. And uh, as uh, our interim police chief, Carl Povlidis had mentioned earlier, we really are looking to kind of grow within our department, uh, the next generation of police officers. And, and these two uh, categories are where we, would be, where we would be growing within. And so you can see here, uh, the police explorer, especially, we do have a lot of Armenians in that category, and that really gives us uh, a great optimism for the future uh, in, in creating more diversity within the department. May I ask one question, because this is something of great interest to me, is uh, an ingredient for increasing the number of active full-time uh, police officers. That number 10 for reserve police officers concerns me. Uh, is that because I remember as a youngster growing up here that we had a significantly greater number of reserve officers and somehow that number has diminished. And that's the area of first engagement. Indeed, as I envision a department with the contributions from the community, we could have our lawyers, doctors, real estate agents, part-time no, no. as uh, police officers uh, to support and assist our full-time heroes. As you, as you said, it's an area of uh, first engagement, and that number has been higher in years gone in years gone by. And in, and sometimes, you know, 
decade, decade and a half ago, we would use that as an entry level step. Yeah. Here's probably the reality of where we are today. Not only are we looking for officers, as I told you, we have seven immediate vacancies, so is everybody else. And so if you want a job as a full-time police officer, you don't have to go through the reserve. A lot of our uh, current reserve officers, we, we have some that are newer, they, and they will remain reserves because they have full-time uh, professions, and we have some who have more tenure than I do, uh, or started about the same time I did, who have had full times. It is a challenge to become a reserve officer when, you know, when I started this profession, training for reserve officers was not the same as for a regular full-time officer. You could do it with less time. Right now, the post the standards same. for reserve officers are the same. Yeah. So that's a year-long commitment to, you know, at least one day a week and part of your weekend in training. So as you start looking at, you know, people who have families and stuff, it's a, it's a much more of a challenge to, to get people into that program. And I said, and if you're looking for as the stepping stone, you know, as we did in 20 years ago, hey, be a reserve for a little while, and then we'll we'll pick you up as full time. As I said, right now, everybody's looking for full time officers. So if you meet the qualifications, you can do that. And I think you guys tapped into that. The, the, a lot of these reserves are now your full time officers. We we, we did. Yeah. And as I said, so what you have left, and as I said, I think we may have uh, we may have a few that are looking to go full time at some point, but we have others who, we and, and we and we really do like them. They they actually they add a lot of value to the community are the ones who are going to be, if you will, career reserve officers. They do something else and then come help us either on the weekends or when we have a major event. Okay. Let's go to the next, next slide. Okay, the next slide uh, it consists of the recruitment, uh, police, the police officer recruit recruitment statistics. Um, Commissioner McCarley, the last time we presented this, you had requested that we uh, separate out uh, those that pass the PAT from those that pass the written exam. So we have done that you know, on this slide for, for you guys tonight. Um, so recognize, let me comment on both because that did come up. Uh, we had conducted a variety of tests uh, from a federal level with respect to uh, testing in those regards. I think the testing here, I have no comment nor any criticism. As I've said earlier in my comments, we're not lowering standards at all. But I did suggest, if I recall that November a meeting, in which in days long past, before most people here were even a thought, uh, certainly not living here in Glendale, there were requirements in various uh, municipal police departments that mandated that those who served had to be 5'11", 5 feet 11 inches tall, or you could not serve. Um, that was not changed in the LAPD until about 1958. And then LAPD began to move forward and other departments follow. So you always have to sort of look at this. At this point, we see no area of concern, but to segregate those out, both for the physical performance test, now to continue that, why that gets very interesting, is that we too in my uh, previous uh, service, uh, both within the uh, LASD and as well the Army, we saw very interesting dynamics that resulted from physical fitness tests. You could theoretically design a physical fitness test, a physical assessment test, which would exclude about 99% of the entire adult population, male and female. So that's always a subject of adjustment. Again, no criticism. I have seen no observable defects with respect to the PAT that is administered in this department. Is it a subject of inquiry across the United States? Yes, uh, has it in days past uh, precluded very qualified individuals from serving in our municipal police departments from New York to Los Angeles? Yes, but that was the only reason that we did that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So to going back to this slide, um, uh, this slide contains the, the statistics for the entire year of 2017. Uh, during that year, we administered three, ex three separate exams. Uh, yeah. At each one of those exams, though, we did test for a police officer recruit bilingual English Armenian speaking, police officer recruit bilingual English Korean speaking, and police officer recruit general. Uh, so uh, those three tests are combined in the in the boxes to the right there, and you can see the numbers uh, for each uh, different recruitment process. Uh, and you can see there on the uh, those that uh, actually apply for the exam, those that end up showing up to the exam is significantly a lot lower. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in some upcoming slides so about our, our turnout rate. Is, so yes. let, me, let me ask a question. The 251 Armenians and the 144 Korean Americans that apply, they just went online, filled out an application. Yeah, then you basically have called them in to 
come and take the test and they just didn't show up. Correct, yeah, N uh, now how it works is you go on governmentjobs.com or on the city's yeah. webpage or joingpd.com, our recruitment page for the police department, and you can select click to apply uh, and just submit an application online. There's no need to come into the HR department. In fact, we don't collect paper applications anymore. Uh, so it is very easy for them to apply. And that is the problem, I think, is why our turnout rate is, is so low, is that uh, the, the ease of application, a lot of people are putting in multiple applications for, for a lot of different cities at the same time, and then whichever one contacts them first, that's the test they go to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chair, that, that's, this is a dynamic that is a problem industry-wide. Yeah. Uh, I'm very uh, professionally active in all of my you know, fellow HR people uh, experience the same drop off in, uh, in, uh, in that. It's a problem and it's really, it, it's disappointing. And what's even more disappointing, and we don't necessarily see it so much in police, but uh, in some of the other jobs we recruit for, uh, uh, we'll, we'll invite maybe a dozen candidates for an interview process and we'll assemble an interview panel and have, you know, uh, interview raters from other agencies there, sub subject matter experts. and. We may have, uh, you know, six of the 12 actually show up and we have the interview panel sitting there, you know, basically uh, twirling their thumbs throughout the day. It's, it's, I don't know if it's a generational thing or what, but it's just something that we see more and more of. I, I, as Sean alludes to, I think the ease with which we're able to apply for jobs by the click of a button is part of the problem with that. I can remember when I was applying for jobs 30 years ago, you had to, go get a paper application and put it in the typewriter, if anybody still knows what that is, and you'd type it and you'd sign it and you'd either walk it down to the employer or put it in the mail. Um, those days are gone. There's, there's if you made a mistake, you have to white out. You guys are old. Yeah. <laughs> Sam, you're only Speak how many years yourself. younger than me? Four? <laughs> okay. Go ahead, please, I'm sorry. Sure, the only, thing I, the only other thing on this slide I want to draw your attention to is the, the box on the left contains the, the numbers of uh, police officer recruits that ultimately were hired in 2017. You can see there we hired one Hispanic, five white, uh, and one Armenian. And you may ask, uh, how did we uh, receive, or how did we appoint one Armenian to police officer recruit when they're not listed under the bilingual recruitment? And that was because that applicant did not, yeah. did not speak the Armenian language fluently enough to, to qualify for the bilingual recruitment, but they did submit an application for the general recruitment and they were selected <laughs> through that one. Uh, and then the other thing that's not listed here, we did uh, recently hire uh, one uh, Korean police officer recruit within the past week. Um, and that's, that was from a result of the 2017 testing, but because it was in this last week, it wasn't collected in this data. Thank you. There it is. Okay, the next slides are, are more. Sorry, uh, just a yeah. clarification. The entire year of 2017, you hired seven total? That's correct. Uh, you know what, actually going back to that, I'm, I'm glad you raised that back up because I forgot to mention too, we had some lateral uh, positions that we, um, we hired for as well. So that's a police officer lateral where they're working for another agency as long as they're work, they have worked for another, agent, another police agency as a police officer for, for up to a year and are currently working for that agency, they can lateral over to our agency. And from that process, we hired three. So uh, in 2017, we hired a total of, of 10 off that list, off those uh, testing processes. Thank you. Uh, so the next slide actually is going to, uh, the next couple slides we're going to talk about our selection process. Um, as you can see, because our, you know, how, how our numbers were reflected in those, in those statistics, we, we do lose a lot of them through the process. So I just want to clarify our process for you, for you tonight. Uh, the first step in the selection process includes the physical agility test and the written exam. And those are administered on the same day. Uh, and those are offsite at the Rio Hondo uh, Police Academy facility. Which one is first? The, the PAT is first yeah. in the morning when they check in, uh, they do the PAT first. If they pass the PAT, we break for an hour lunch and then they're invited back in the afternoon to take the written exam. And that's not modified male, female, it is. No, it's the same, the same for, same for all. Standards. And that's the same for bilingual applicants in general. this has been in, in existence for some particular period of time. Yes, and, and the, the real Han, uh, the, the, the things listed in the PAT, the yeah. Everything except for the 1.5 mile run, the 10 push-ups, the 15 sit-ups, those are Glendale specific, but everything else is a post uh, standard. Yeah, post standard. Yeah. So for, for those of us, it's, a, it's the same. Right. Um, and so again, uh, uh, the, our, what's listed here uh, that uh, comprises the PAT, we have the 99 yard obstacle course uh, in which they have to vault a 34 inch obstacle, a six foot solid fence climb, a six foot chain link fence, 
a 165 pound dummy body drag. Uh, Commissioner Gazarian, it's 165 pounds. <laughs> uh, the uh, 500 yard run, uh, and those are all for points. Uh, so, uh, and then the, the last three events, uh, are the 1.5 mile run, the 10 push-ups and 15 sit-ups are all pass or fail. So the 10 push-ups, 15 sit-ups, those are done in cadence and they have to complete those in order to be successful in the PAT. If you cannot do 10 push-ups, you, you are dismissed for the day. Is there oh, a time frame? Won't qualify to be a police officer in the city of Glendale. Is there a time sure. frame to do Yes, and the 1.5 mile run yeah. is, they, they are given 14, at, uh, 14 minutes or less to complete right. that. How about the push-ups and the sit-ups? Is there a time frame there, for that? There isn't a time frame. It's done in cadence, so uh, the Rio Hondo proctors will, will call out the number, and then they have to perform the push-up in cadence. What do you mean by vaulting a 34 so there's like, it's a, one of those horses, a wood horse, it, you know, and it's 34 inches off the ground, they have to jump over that. Oh, I see. So it's, it's, it's more like a steeple chase type of a thing. Exactly. Well, you, I thought of <laughs> vaulting like a pole vault. I'm thinking, know. what do you mean for 34 inches? Okay. <laughs> like track and field days are coming back, yes. Yeah, Go ahead. Okay. Sure, and then if they, so if they pass the PAT, then they come back to take the written exam in the afternoon. Um, this is uh, provided by Danone Associates. Uh, this is a Scantron-based standardized test, and it follows post guidelines. Uh, it consists of 100 items, and we give them the maximum amount of time allowed for this test, which is two hours. Uh, and it comprises language skills, which tests their reading comprehension and writing skills, and then problem solving, uh, problem solving, which includes their reasoning ability and accuracy with names and numbers. I'm sorry, is this a multiple choice? Test? Yes, it is. Uh -huh. So no, you have A, B, C, D, and you pick the correct. Right choice. Correct. And you're al allocating 50 questions for one hour? That's correct. Wow. Uh, you, know, you know, the State Bar of California so gives gives 33 questions per an hour for, for people to pass the bar exam. So I think the test is a bit too stringent. Well, so actually, the, um, the I, I noted that this it, yeah. I noted that this is the maximum amount of time. We, the, 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 That's uh, the maximum. Amount there's of a time. minimum amount of time of one one hour and forty minutes. So actually, we we pushed that, uh -huh. and uh, I've administered the la all the tests in the last year, and and majority finish within half or with with half an hour remaining in time. Um, I, so I suppose it depends on the uh, on the, the, the call the, of the, the question the and type the question, question itself. Yes. I see. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Chair, can I add before we move to the next? Uh, it says the written exam, Dunno and Associates. Uh, these exams are, we purchase them and they're designed, they're actually scientifically designed to, to uh, ensure that they measure the traits and characteristics that lead to someone being a good uh, mm -hmm. police officer. It's yeah. called validation and it's really important that, uh, that they be uh, designed in such a manner. So it's, uh, these aren't just something that you know, somebody throws together and hey, let's throw in some reading comprehension or some you know, multiple choice. It's, they're, they're very much researched and well, uh, well done, so. Is there, is there a reason you do, the, because by the time I do the physical agility test and it comes the afternoon, I'm so tired I'm taking a nap while I'm taking a test. So is there a reason you do them? Yeah, really. Is there a reason you do them the same day? And instead of doing them on a different day, so they would be more fresh and they come in. Is there, no, I'm, I'm not saying, <laughs> is, is that part of the reason you do it in the afternoon to have somebody who is tired but needs to also focus? Just trying that to may be part of it. I think, I think the, the main reason we do them on the same day is to hopefully get a, a bigger applicant pool. I mean, if you're committing one day to a test versus you know a couple days where if you're already you know in a current uh, working somewhere else taking two days off to to come to multiple exams it might be a little harder for some so. i'm beginning I, to think this is a stringent test no i suggest <laughs> that the chief or the acting chief invite all of us to take the test uh, so to, this is going to be a field assessment yeah. we'll, we'll take we, your applications we we actually are going to nominate Commissioner McCarley to take the <laughs> test and let us know how it went. <laughs> None of us would pass the background. <laughs> Don't worry. So <laughs> just just to add, add to uh, what Sean, Sean was saying is one of the other things we've done is we've spent a lot of time uh, using uh, before IPA internal audit to speed yeah. up our process. Said everybody is looking, so we're looking for ways to consolidate our processes so that we're not bringing somebody. Hey, can you come this Saturday for a physical? Can you come next Saturday for this? Because you know we need to get to them faster. We said everybody may be looking for recruits. I'm only responsible for this organization, so I want them first. 
if you will. And so what we're trying to do is find ways to consolidate the testing process so that we can get it done quicker, get to the backgrounds, get them done expeditiously, and then get them hired before, as you said, it's easy enough to apply to lots of agencies before another agency gets them. Thank you. Next. So speaking of moving along quickly, so after the uh, PAT written exam, within two weeks we schedule the oral interview. So those that are successful PAT written exam move on in the selection process to an oral interview. Those are conducted here in the police department. And uh, it's, it's conducted uh, in front of a professional panel that's usually comprised of two field, or, yeah, two field training officers and one police sergeant. And those interviews take place uh, for approximately 20 to 30 minutes per candidate. Uh, and those that are successful in an oral interview are then placed on, yes. Let me, let me ask you. It says what 100% of applicants score. So you go through a uh, physical and then you go through a written, you pass both. Yeah. Then you come to a oral and that you need to get 70% before you can pass. Correct, and so the reason why it says 100% here is because the PAT and written exam are both pass fail. So uh, they're not considered in their final score for, based for their rank on the eligible list. So based on their oral performance, whatever score they receive there, uh, that comprises 100% uh, which factors into how they're ranked on our eligible list. And, and, and Matt, how many people usually on an oral interview board? So for, for a police officer. The panel. Or? The panel consists of, sorry, of three raiders. How many? Four. Three. 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 Yeah, three raiders from different departments. No, from our own from our own department. And again, those, it usually consists of two field training officers and one police sergeant. And our, just to, for our information, is this our preset questions that are asked or this is an open when you're yeah this is so this is a standardized uh, oral exam meaning we ask all the candidates the same questions so we provide those questions to the raters uh, and they ask all the same questions to all the candidates they see and at this point they failed they're done correct yes and then if they would irrelevant if they pass the other exactly I mean, and if they want to reapply they would have to start back at the first step which is the PAT written exam mm. but they've already passed the so they, but they would have to go again and do it? Unfortunately, yes, they would have to, to restart the entire process over. Is that they would have to submit a new application and they would be invited to, to attend the PAT written exam again. Is that because of our procedures in the city of Glendale or is that because that's what they do in the police departments all over? Uh, to and, I, I, unfortunately, I cannot answer that question. I haven't researched other departments specific to this question. I don't, I don't know. Mr. Chavez, yeah. uh, let me help you out. Because if I applied and failed the oral interview examination, if you give me a pass on my earlier PAT, uh, the, by the time I reapply, I may have suffered uh, a physical ailment that makes me unable to perform those tasks. That would be my uh, inference from what I see to be the case, that you reapply all over again. Thanks for the help. <laughs> right. Mr. Chair. Uh, I think we're at that point where I wanted to, to give sort of a summary comment about the testing and selection process. And please forgive me, all those who continue to listen, because I tend to expand the conversation into earlier experiences with the same population of young people from 18. You recruit an adult 18 through approximately 25. And those are uh, fine young men and women whom we asked to serve in the Glendale Police Department, the LA Police Department, the Army, and the military services. It's the same issue across the board. And if I roll back my own personal history three years earlier, and our subject of discussion at the Army was how to recruit this same population of people, we had a running statistic that's been published, and that is that out of the 12 million or so young men and women who come of age, 18 to 25, those are those who can most effectively serve. They're young, they can have a long career in the Glendale Police Department or the Marines or whatever, a third of those fail out because they don't have the intellectual capability to take that written exam that you've just described. They can't spell Glendale and they certainly can't spell Army or Marine Corps. Or the next 30% by reason of uh, what's happening in our society across the board are incapable physically of performing the PAT test, or as we call it, the APFT, Army Physical Fitness Test, that allows them to serve because they don't have the physical capability. And then the last bunch on the background investigation, which we call the whole ethics, mores, and how your and what your background happened to be, the next percentage 
of uh, those candidates fail out because they have something in their background and their paper that really prevents them from serving in positions of great honor, such as the Glendale Police Department. So we're left, and we're all sharing the same population, the military services and the police departments, of those very small number of that population of 18 to 25 that we want who are capable. And then those that are capable, you have to encourage them to pursue a career in law enforcement or in the uh, service and uh, just put the idea of serving as lawyers or real estate brokers or doctors and delay that for a couple of years. Thank you, Commissioner uh, McCarty. Uh, go ahead, please. Right, so, um, so those that do pass an oral interview then, again, as, as I stated, they're placed on the eligible list and then they would be placed into a, a background, uh, the background process, which consists of a comprehensive background investigation Candidates are asked to fill out a personal history statement that consists of 275 questions. And, and those, uh, those questions contain um, issues, or, or cover issues regarding credit, financial history, drug usage, and, and criminal behavior. All, all those things could potentially disqualify applicants in the process. And as part of this process, uh, candidates are also given a polygraph examination to ensure that they're being open and honest uh, you know, during their background investigation. So if candidates can successfully pass their background, then they move on to the final hiring steps. Uh, first, they have a chief's oral interview. If the chief approves, they are given a conditional offer of employment letter, uh, and uh, a conditional offer of employment letter subject to passing the psychological medical examinations, which are administered according to uh, post-medical and psychological guidelines. I'm glad to see that you're not discriminating against bald people, because you know. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. So that concludes the slides on the selection process. Uh, next, we're going to discuss a little bit of uh, on our recruitment challenges. As we kind of uh, have been already um, have been the focus of, of discussion already tonight. But um, you know, I think uh, the first bullet point here is a uh, small pool of qualified applicants. You know, currently we have a good economy, and I think, uh, and with that, we have low unemployment. And as a result of that, you know, we have not that many folks that are really interested in, in choosing a career in law enforcement. You know, if they have the choice between choosing a job that you know secures their safety and, and they don't have to risk uh, you know Getting life or shot. yes exactly uh, you know they're going to go with that that position instead um, so there really is a is a is a nationwide problem of really getting qualified uh, applicants um, to to seek out a job in, in law enforcement and then from that uh, those that do quali are do apply the turnout rate is low and again we've mentioned you know the reason for that I think is mostly attributed to the fact that it's so easy to apply and and because of the, uh, we're competing against multiple agencies that are all experiencing the same prob problem, uh, and, and where those candidates end up, uh, again, is, you know, is whoever gets them first, and so that's why our turnout rate is so low. And again, those that do show up to, to, to take our test, and, and you know, they, they lack a lot of the physical fitness uh, that is required to take on the position of police officer. And then again, in our background, we do lose a lot to disqualifying factors, and again, those are based on post standards, you know, not that the city applies, but again, that the city is mandated through the post standards. And then lastly, a competitive hiring environment. You know, this was mentioned by Commissioner Manukian. you know, uh, benefits, salary, all those things contribute, you know, what, when you're looking for a career in law enforcement, which agency is offering uh, the best pay, the best benefits, um, you know, and so a lot of those applicants, because it's already limited, you know, they're gonna shop around for the best, for the best position, best city. Hopefully they'll choose Glendale, and, and I think what you guys have said, and, and what the department is, is spoken to as well, uh, the city of Glendale and the Glendale uh, Police Department um, is well respected, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, and it's a desirable city to work for. So really, um, we want to promote that and, and, and get that word out. And so that's why we're going to go into the next slide, which is our recruitment strategies, uh, to really hopefully attract more more candidates to this uh, to this career in law enforcement. The first bullet point is creating long-term opportunities. Uh, as mentioned, you know we have the G the Glendale Police Department Explorers, and those are uh, the youth uh, the youth of uh, the city that are ages 14 to 18 are eligible to be a, an explorer, and then college students are are eligible to be police cadets. And as you can see, you know this really is attractive. Our, our hopes, our hope is to attract those those youth in the community that really have an interest in law enforcement. Start them at a young age, uh, get them in the door, give them the experience they would need to be successful in a career in law enforcement, 
and hopefully mitigate some of those disqualifying behaviors that would maybe come out you know, if they were just you know, out on the streets and not involved in, in <laughs> or working for a police department. Uh, some of the uh, short-term opportunities we're looking at uh, that we've already implemented um, more frequent exams. Uh, in this last year, we moved to quarterly testing. Uh, so we test every three months. And prior to that, we tested about every six months. And again, uh, the, the reason for this is we want to try to get to those candidates first before any other agencies do. And so this, this uh, quarterly testing every three months allows us to, to try, hopefully reach them faster than the other agencies around us. Uh, the other thing we've done is actively recruited military and pre-service academy graduate candidates. Recently, we brought a bulletin to the commission uh, that you guys have, did, did approve and we, we have since uh, posted uh, for pre-service academy graduate applicants. And again, these are uh, applicants that have already are self-sponsored and put themselves through the academy. Uh, so we can hire them on. They don't have to attend our academy and they can, they can then become a, a police officer with the city of Glendale without having to go through an academy. Uh, and again, the, the, the benefit of doing these recruitments is really streamlines the process for us because military and pre-service academy graduates, we have the ability to waive the PAT, possibly the written, and the written exam for them as well because they've already gone through those processes with their respect through, um, through either their pre-service or academy experience. And the military, obviously, if uh, we're looking at um, waiving the PAT for them as well, uh, hopefully those individuals you know, that are actively serving have, have had to maintain a certain physical standard that would meet the, the Glendale Police Department standards. Uh, and the last two bullet points, uh, um, our uh, interim police chief Carl Poblitis had mentioned uh, we have partnered with the Innovation Performance and Audit Department uh, in working with coming up with some other uh, opportunities uh, and, and the IPA department helped us develop the recruitment application checklist and the physical agility test practice sheet. Uh, both those things are going to help uh, those that go through the testing process to provide more information to them uh, so that it, hopefully it's more effective. The application checklist is really just a visual tool that applicants can use uh, that provides all the different steps they would need to go through for the selection process. As I just covered, it's a very pretty rigorous exam, a lot of components to it. So having that checklist, being able to visually check off where they're at in the process, knowing how much further they have to go. So if they're at, a, if they complete the PAT written exam, they know, okay, in two weeks I have an oral. In, in three weeks, I'll have, uh, I'll go through the background. And so in a month, I, I have the potential of being hired. Hopefully then, as a result, they'll want to stick with us and not maybe go to another agency or just uh, not want to, or not bother with the process because it, it uh, appears to be too rigorous. And then the physical agility practice sheet, again, one of our um, challenges, again, is having those, uh, having folks show up to the PAT ready to, to take on the PAT. So what we're gonna do is post uh, the practice test on our on our uh, joint P GPD website, and they can look they can look at that, uh, find out what the requirements to pass the PAT are, and do a self assessment at home, take that test, and so that they're prepared to, to pass the PAT when they show up to the test. So really, we're providing a lot of education upfront to these to these folks, so hopefully they're they're successful in the process. Because at the end of the day, we're really looking. I mean, well, we want them to pass, and so we're providing a lot of uh, opportunity or, or a lot of knowledge to, to hopefully prepare them to, to, to pass this process. And then this is the last slide uh, for tonight. This is just our outreach and partnerships. Uh, some things that you know we've been working on with the department uh, um, uh, in order to attract and hire police officers, the Glendale Police Department, uh, along with HR, has really uh, increased their recruitment efforts uh, on social media and out in the community. Uh, most of our recruiting efforts uh, try to go to where millennials are, and you know nowadays that's on the mobile phone. So uh, we're posting all our advertisements on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we, the Glendale Police Department has their own Twitter page, their own Facebook page. And so we're highlighting job opportunities on those, on those websites. And then again, our joint P GPD website, um, any applicant can go there and find information out about all, our, all of the job postings for the police department. Um, we do have partnerships in the community, ANCA. Um, they posted um, that the police department is looking for um, police officers. Um, some other things that the, uh, the Professional Standards Bureau has uh, participated in a job, a job and career fair hosted by Assembly Member Audrey Nazarian. Uh, some upcoming events include uh, a recruitment and uh, informational session hosted by ANCA uh, with both police and fire, and that's gonna be on March 24th. Uh, there's going to be a meet your Glendale police where's, officers where's event. The location of it? Uh, I actually have the, the paper, if you don't mind, I can reference it. I, I believe okay. it's at the Youth Center. The Youth Center on Chestnut. It's the Youth Center on Chestnut. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and then the, uh, the Meet Your Glendale Police Officers event is gonna be located at the Glendale Galleria. Um, that's gonna happen later this month. Um, so just lastly in closing, I just wanna uh, let everyone know or encourage those that are interested in career in law enforcement, visit our Joint GPD website. Again, that has a lot of information on there for uh, prospective applicants, and again, share that with anyone that may have an interest in, in a career with the Mr. Glendale Chavez, Police Department. Mr. And you're Chavez. speaking to all those who are watching us on TV as well. That's so correct. hopefully we'll get 100 recruits this evening. What, what is the meaning of the police vehicle that at the tail end of it has a yellow taxi color? What is that? Is That's it some kind of a marketing? putting you out of business. What is that? When they get caught with It was uh, actually one of our uh, Glendale Police Foundation uh, members made a donation, and so that was for DUI awareness. And so if you oh. really look at the car, it will, part of the car will tell you that if you get arrested for DUI, DUI what the costs are for the DUI, so you have a choice. I you know, see. do you want That's a taxi great. or do you want black and white cab service that only goes I to the- I thought you were giving free tax rights to uh, people yeah. who are so, drunk. <laughs> so it's actually, it was, <laughs> and we've actually taken that out to DUI checkpoints. Oh, uh, wow. And That's it's great. actually had to book a couple of people once or twice. That's great. Thank, Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah, Ms. Wayne. Commissioner. Uh, you know, w just a comment that based on everything that you guys have presented to us, I, I think this is a challenge that it's only going to get worse in recruiting and being able to attract the the best of the best out there. I think uh, along with the department, the community in itself also needs to look at this as a viable career. We can, you know, stand up here, yell and scream all we want to the community to, be, to, to become a part of this process, but they also have to see that this is a career that, you know, uh, is, is worthy if you, as long as you, you meet these requirements. and and, and Asking someone to, um, you know, be able to meet those physical guidelines, it's the bare minimum that I, I personally think that if you want to be a police officer, you should be able to jump that 34 inch, you know, it's the least. And, and I think it keeps us, and, and also we have a part in the, all of this to become more active within our community to make sure we promote and, and, and we recognize that the Glendale Police Department and, and, and the, the career and the opportunities that exist. So it's, it's, it involves everyone involved in this community to make it. So thank you very much and, and I, everything that I've seen, I, I feel much stronger than what I felt before and with, which was we have a phenomenal department. Thank you for everything you guys do. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Devine. I just Mr. have Devine. one question. One uh, question, per, Mr. Per, well, perhaps Matt could answer Matt it. Could answer uh, going to the or final, the going to the final hiring steps, uh, the chief's oral interview and meeting. Uh, if you have a cadre of, let's say, eight uh, candidates that could be interviewed and, and hired, uh, do they come off a list, and does the rule of three apply in that process? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Rubin, that's a, a, a great question. Uh, typically, we would uh, select off the list, and that's generally how we do it. Uh, the police officer recruit classification, however, is an unclassified uh, position, which uh, this is an action the commission took, um, well, I don't recall, it was several years ago, but uh, the purpose of that was to assist us in accelerating this process, and you know, as as Sean said, and as uh, you know, Chief Povolitis said, you know, part of this challenge is getting to these candidates before they go somewhere else. And uh, I'd say for the most part, and the Chief can correct me, when we have a list, and let's say there's eight people on it, uh, we're gonna jump on those folks immediately, all eight of them. We're not gonna do them three at a time and risk losing them. And we'll start them in the backgrounds and we'll line up the Chief's orals uh, uh, in a rapid uh, fire manner. Is that correct, Chief? That's correct, and we need that. We need that agility in the in the system because if we were doing them three backgrounds at a time, by the time we get down the list, they'll have been picked up by another organization. Now so we work our way down the list, but we as we'll assign multiple backgrounds all at once. All right. So it's possible then that all eight candidates could be hired uh, depending yes. on the chief's assessment. Yeah. Of Prior to making that unclassified, that would not have been possible. So uh, we can jump on those candidates. And one other thing the, the unclassified status does enable us to do is to you know, identify if, if we come across an outstanding candidate, perhaps somebody who's in the military and on leave for the weekend and we wanna quick coordinate a, uh, a PAT 
and written uh, some weekend, uh, we can actually do that uh, under under the uh, the uh, flexibility that's afforded under a, under an unclassified process. Okay, and, so. and that does not circumvent the, the charter requirement for the rule of three. Not uh, not okay. that I would be aware of. And, and getting back to the uh, <coughs> demographics by rank, uh, in th those cases uh, where there's promotions involved, whether it's uh, going from sergeant to lieutenant or lieutenant to captain, uh, the rule of three does apply there, is that correct? Y yes, sir. So yes. after all of the testing, the P PAT, and all of the uh, gymnastics that these candidates go through, the final decision will be based on who finishes in the top three, and then finally the chief really is the one that makes the final decision regardless of where they finish in the top three, is that correct? Well, that's correct. If you're referring to the promoted ranks, sergeant, lieutenant, those are all classified civil service recruitments. Uh, it's the entry level, the police yeah, officer right. recruit that's unclassified where we have more flexibility. But uh, yeah, for all the, uh, the promoted uh, levels, uh, it's the rule of three. You know, we talked. About, we talk about rule of three, uh, Commissioner Devine, uh, and members of the commission. Uh, I've always understood it to be rule of three, but it's up to the chief picking up three two one or two three one or two one three. Uh, and am I now hearing you when you say this is a classified position? That it's this body that has made that decision some years ago. That it is so, or. or, or, or let me clarify, uh, members of the commission, uh, all of the positions that we recruit for f throughout the city fall under the classified service. There right. are few, there are some exceptions, and those exceptions are, are uh, made by this body. And uh, yeah, I could probably count them on one hand. There aren't many, but- uh, This rule of three is one of them. The rule of three applies to every, every position under the classified service. Under the charter. Does, under the charter. Under the charter, yeah. yes. Uh, but uh, uh, under an unclassified process, uh, Rule of Three would not necessarily right. be be uh, applicable. So, so it could be a Rule of Eight. Could be a Rule of Eight. Could be the Rule of a List. Uh, yes. Rule of Twenty. Okay. It's that flexibility. And again, it's done for police officer recruit. We do it for uh, some of the uh, um, uh, apprentice positions within our water and power utility. And the reason for that is that. Uh, they, uh, they, they enter into these programs that typically take four or five years for them to achieve journey level status. And we need the ability to uh, remove them from employment. Uh, they may go a year and a half or two years into the program and hit a wall where they can't proceed anymore. And those programs uh, are unclassified for that reason. And I, and I guess I could add, it's like, based on where we are with police officers right now, as I told you, we had seven vacancies and you've kind of now got a sense of where the process uh, takes us. If any one of you happen to know a qualified candidate and refer them our direction, we'll end up hiring them. It's like we, the, the number of vacancies that we have, if we can find a qualified candidate that goes, can go all the way through the process, meet the standards, we will end up hiring them. And the unclassified uh, status helps us do that. In fact, we'll probably be back to discuss doing something very, very similar uh, with our uh, uh, police communications operator, operators, our dispatchers, because we're having the same issue there. We can't move fast enough right now in order to get them and we're not filling the positions that we need to. So we'll be looking at broadening the outreach and uh, asking for some adjustments to allow us to expand the training program uh, to give people a chance to be more successful so that we can fill those uh, and do them, as I said before, they get picked up by, by, by somebody else. And I guess if I could, if you will indulge me for a couple of moments, just to, just to just to kind of go there, it's like uh, Sean did a great job of filling those up. But it's like, you know, as I look as as I kind of look through the process, and uh, you kind of see the numbers that we go. Look, we have about an eighty percent no show rate on our for our written exams for people that put in there. And to me, that's one of the challenges that we're going to have to look at. It's like, you know, we have ever since I've been here, we hire about one percent one percent of those who actually apply and participate in the process. So I'm gonna take the 2,000 applications and set them out and just look at the numbers that actually apply to us. We have traditionally hired about 1%, that hasn't changed. It ends up, I think, with the numbers you saw there, about 1.6% of the people who, who apply. It's, as I said, the job's not for everybody. It's always been very difficult. And I have yet, you know, I don't hire a category, I hire a person. You know, we sit down, we have a conversation, same thing in promotions. We look at what people have done. Uh, we look at their merits. 
and we end up hiring the person and we're looking for the absolute best people we can find anywhere in the community. But some of the things that we're looking at, because I think you hit it right on the head, and you mentioned it's like not everybody wants their, their child to be a police officer. I'm not sure when someone comes home and says, mom, dad, I wanna be a cop, unless you're a multi-generational police family. I'm not sure that's met with resounding, oh yeah, hey, that's a great idea. I think it's met with a lot of concern, and if you look at the news and the challenges that the profession faces, that's probably to be, to be expected. So part of, I think, what, we are, what we're looking at is not only uh, are we reaching out for the recruits themselves, but we're reaching out to do some education within the community so that we're educating the parents. And so you will start to see us on the local tele cable television channels to reach out, especially within our own community, to show you what Glendale Police Department does, to highlight the officers that work for us, to show the customer service, to show the excellent police work that these men and women do on a, on a daily basis. Some of that is designed to help recruit, but some of that is also designed to help educate, realizing that our target audience is, is uh, much broader. Uh, Mr. Doyle mentioned it, but you talk about the unclassified things, you know, part of where we want to go recruit is, uh, off the, is people coming out of the military. And so we are talking about waiving the PAT, but we're also looking at one of the reasons we've gone to using the no testing as opposed to the post test. One is that we can grade it faster, two is we can take it on the road with us. So what we're looking at is being able to go to a military base and look at those people who are going to be coming out of the military and be able to do that test right then, right there, you know, f you know, from nuts, you know, from oral to, uh, or from written to oral, and get that part of the process done, handle the background parket, packet, and we can be moving uh, that much faster. With IPA, you're gonna see us increase our social media presence, and you're gonna see some videos where, you know, as I've, I've told Lieutenant Gilkerson, part of our uh, uh, recruiting is really to make it, you know, make it look like someone's looking in the mirror, that you see somebody like you uh, in, in the process. So I think there's some, uh, some of the folks behind me could probably bench press me with one arm. Uh, that's not me. Uh, you know, others can run really, really fast, you know, but we want you to see however you see yourself, you want to see that in the police department said we need a broad, diverse group of people and a broad, diverse skill sets in the department in order to be successful. And so we're doing that. And so we're also expanding our recruiting costs. We're not looking at just our professional standards bureau to be the recruiters for the department. We're asking people within the department to go out there and we're asking people in the department, how did we find you? And my favorite question is, how do we find more of you? Where do we go to get your, your friends? Because that is not an easy process these, day, these days. And so where we need to be on social media, where we need to be on the phones, uh, we're talking to Mr. Doyle about how, how do we do text notifications for our testing processes? Because it's not my generation. I'm gonna guess most people up here, if I call you, answer the phone. That's not necessarily true of a modern generation. It's like, they won't answer the phone. Text them, you get an immediate response back, and so sometimes you have to text in order to get the, the conversation going. But and so we're looking at- driving. Uh, preferably not. So we're looking at making those kind of, you know, small, the, those kind of small innovations. And said, and I'll just close with, this said, we are looking to hire the best and the brightest. We are looking for a broad, outre a broad outreach, and we're looking to put the best people in the right places in this department to serve this community. And that's- uh, I'll leave it at that unless you have any additional you know, one questions. Of, one of the comments that I also, unfortunately our, our country and our community has to change its attitude against our police officers. That's, that's the other part in general that I think it's very unfortunate that uh, this, you know, what they do for us is, is, is priceless and, and, and uh, we should appreciate that because I know, I know of some countries that don't have this type of law enforcement and, and you wouldn't want to live there, let's put it that way. Listen, I, I, I would echo those comments that said the, the men and women of the Glendale Police Department work very hard every day to protect this community. They're extremely competent. As I said, I've, I've told some of you, I will take this department, I will stack it up against any other police department, person for person, pound for pound, and we come out ahead. Thank you, Chief. Any any comments? Any other comments? I just wanted to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Devine, Commissioner Devine. Um. <coughs> Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody from both sides for the uh, great presentations, uh, both the GPOA and, and staff, and of course, uh, Chief Provolitis. Uh, what I've gotten out of this uh, is in terms, there's two issues. One is the hiring and the recruiting to bring people into the, the police department. And we've heard that, uh, you know, they're doing all sorts of great things to try and get that accomplished. When you look at the statistics, uh, I see that uh, there's an increase in some of the uh, the minority uh, or the eth ethnicity uh, areas, and I don't have a problem with that. I think that uh, at the end of the day, that's going to work out. The thing that I have uh, a question on is the demographic, uh, demographics by rank. And 
The reason I asked about the rule of three for the recruits, and, and Mr. Doyle answered that very well, uh, I think there's a problem in terms of the, the hiring or the promotion process in terms of, based on what I see here on the demographics by rank. And at that point, when you have uh, somebody going from a police officer to a sergeant or a sergeant to lieutenant or lieutenant to captain, uh, I see a great disparity in both the, uh, the ethnic areas and in the gender areas. And I'm concerned because at that point, uh, these people that are interviewing for these positions to be hired or promoted into, uh, again, a sergeant, lieutenant, or captain, as far as I can see, they all have almost the same standards and qualifications. They've gone through all the testing. They've met the PATs. They've reached a point where they can move up in the, the ranks. And so I think they're all on a level playing field. And unless I'm missing something, what it comes down to in this area is well, what I'm going to call the, uh, for lack of a better word, the whim of the, the chief or the whim of the, the person that's going to hire, look at the, the list of three and, uh, and hire off that list. And I think, and Mr. Uh, Chief Corval, I just can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that perhaps there could be something done in that area uh, that would allow, uh, again, say three people that have passed all the tests, the standards are the same for all of them, they're, they're prime people for any of these positions, and to relegate their promotions again to the, uh, the decision of one person, uh, I, I, I feel that that may be part of the cause why we're looking at this demographic, demographic uh, chart that is really pretty, you know, lopsided in terms of the, as I said, the gender and the ethnic uh, positions in these areas. So perhaps uh, the chief can talk about that a little bit and maybe there's a way we can, uh, something can be done that would give uh, more latitude to the, the, the chief. And this would apply for any department, not only f police, but fire and anyone that, because you all have to go by the same rule of three. So I don't know if I've made myself clear as far as my concern, but uh, what can be done to level out this playing field at those levels, at those promotional levels? This, I, I'll let my minute list, Mr. Doyle, answer part of that question because I think, I believe the rule of three is in the, in the charter. And so we live by the rule of three. And, I, and uh, as I told you, it's like I've never hired a category, I've hired a person. And so we set up a testing process and inter internally uh, for police recruit, you got to go through the PAT and all of that. When we're doing promotionals inside, we don't run them through physical exams. We'll run them through potentially written exams and then we'll, we'll have an, a, a panel that assesses their skill sets in order to be able to match that. And from there, I'm committed to making sure that that playing field is level and that people are being assessed on their skills and on their merits. And so that that playing field is, is fair. And then, you know, Generally, where we're, where we're going is the city provides the rule, of, the rule of three. That's available to make sure that we have, if you will, the best fit when we're looking at, at uh, uh, how we hire into a particular position, and that's limited to those three candidates, which the names would come to the, to the desk, uh, based on a, you know, an individual interview. And I guess sometimes the way I look at that is going, we're a, we're a team effort, and so sometimes if you have all operational people in your week, in your team and an administrative person, you may reach for the person who has the administrative skills. If you have administrative skills but you need an operational person and somebody fits that category based on their performance, you might be looking there. And historically in the department, it's pretty much gone down the list. Not always. Okay. You think that uh, if that rule was changed, and I don't know, it would be, I'd take a charter change, I'm sure, to yes. make that a rule of six or eight so that the chief would have a wider uh, cadre of people to choose from. Perhaps in that cadre there would be more uh, people in the gender or ethnic groups that could be uh, considered. Uh, do you think that would uh, help level out this playing field you, here? You can always expand that, but I think the other thing that we're looking at in, or, in the organization is to mentor uh, folks in the organization and to give them the skill sets to compete. But I'll also kind of go back to uh, if you look at the police departments, we're a 30 year, you're a 20 to 30 year career for, for most people. And building the experience 
and the credibility that you need to be a supervisor and then a manager does take some time. It's not something that's learned generally in, in a couple of years. And so if you look at the demographics, you'll start to see the shifts as people move through, uh, through that organization and they do that. But it's also got to be a mutual uh, agreement. Um, I can tell you I've had conversations over the years with people in, an orga in the organization where I thought they would make great supervisors or great managers and it's like you go to encourage them to take the, the testing process and they look at you and go, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing and I have no desire to, to move up. And so as I said, there's got to be sort of that mutual thing between the organization and the individual. Do they, are, are they willing to take on that additional responsibility? Some people are you know, very content, whether it's a supervisor or in a specialized assignment or something else. Others are looking to do that and we look to support the, support the movement up. I, I understand that, but my concern is after that process, you've convinced someone to take the test and now they're on the list and there's a list of six people. And uh, for whatever reason, there's one ethnic group that is at the top of that list and then another ethnic group that may have finished lower based on the interview panel, whether it be a community panel or the uh, internal panel. Uh, do you think, again, that it would help level out this list in terms of spreading out the, uh, the gender and the ethnicity if you have the ability to look at all six of the candidates uh, and let me, let me answer that in two ways. I'm okay with the rule of three, because I, I th and I'll let the, the GPOA speak for itself and, and its membership, but as a manager, I'm always happy to have choices. I'm always glad to have a pool of candidates. I want the largest qualified pool of candidates that I can get so that then I can, uh, and I can assess what, what we need in the organization and I can assess, assess the individuals based on their accomplishments and merits and then select the best person. So, so you know, as a man, from a management perspective, sure, I always like I always like a choice, okay. but but I can also work within the rule of three. Okay, but based on that, and I think that was a great answer. Uh, you think if you had a wider cadre, you had all six people or eight people to choose from, uh, that would have some impact on uh, again leveling out this list or making it more <coughs> even. Do you think that would impact uh, what we see here in terms of? very little diversity. I truly don't know how to answer that, that specific question uh, because I don't know if it would make a difference. As I told you, I think we hire the best and the brightest. And from that standpoint, I think our people are competitive. This is, you know, this is a, a sharp police department. Uh, as I said, I will stack it up against any police department anywhere, anywhere else. And so I think those that choose to, you know, further their careers by promotion um, will be competitive in, the, in that process because they work hard and they're, and they're sharp. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Chief, seconds, thank you. Chief Povolaitis, uh, you know, earlier when Commissioner Devine spoke of the rule of three and I tried to uh, get, a, get a clear understanding of what that was about, uh, I was left with the understanding that it is a classified, for classified positions, yes? Correct. Rule of three, which is in effect, means the person doing the choosing can pick two, one, three, in whatever order. That's correct. It's not rule of three, whoever came in number one got to be picked number one, whoever no. came in second then gets picked second, right? Okay. Th that is correct. The rule of three allows latitude within, within the top three candidates from the testing process. Right. Any one of them can be selected. And in hearing my fellow commissioners inquiry, I'm understanding his question to be, Commissioner Devine's question to be, if you had, instead of three to choose from, if you had six to choose from, would that be better for you? And, and then I hear you saying, well, I'll let the GPOA speak for its members, but I always like a large pool. As I said, I'll let the GPOA speak right. for its membership, but as a, as a manager, look, uh, you know, having a selection, you know, that's like if you tell me that I have one person to choose from, Okay, that's not much of a choice. Right. If I have three, that's mm -hmm. that's fine. So I, that's and, the setup. And, and, I, and, and I prefer large pools of qualified candidates. It's nice to be able to so, so assess Chief, people, and it's nice to have that, that so, environment. So, Chief, so that's Mr. Ross, could you sit, sit well, down for a second on. until we finish? Well, I'm hold sorry. On. So that's the setup. So my, my, my question is, is now based on that premise, a very specific one, because you've been with the, with the department for quite some time, and you have been most recently as its interim chief. Correct? Yes? Yes. How many uh, 
police sergeant did you oversee promoting from officer to sergeant during that period of time? I don't, because I don't know the as, answer. As interim chief or in the, or somewhere in that process? No, no, as an interim chief. Oh, well, we have not done a sergeant's promotion as how interim How about chief, how but. many lieutenants? None. How many captains? None. Thank you. So, so as you stand here today, there is no track record for us to scrutinize or to bless that you have done a great job or not no. such a great job not from, as an individual. from your and available not in the position of interim chief. I'm sorry? Not in the position of interim chief. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and as, as your previous rank uh, of a captain, did you oversee the promotion of officers to sergeants? Is that what? The, the chief would have had the final say, but we all would have participated in the process. But right. that's the chief's final say. Right. So in all promotions, the chief has the final say, is that correct? That's correct. And you in your capacity currently as, are you still interim or did they make you chief I'm, yet? I'm still interim. Okay. <laughs> as, as, as interim chief, uh, there's always tomorrow, as interim chief, you have not yet uh, we've, we've signed off on any promotions. No, we have not done promotional processes, we've right. done hiring processes. What, okay. Uh, so when we talk about rule of three, uh, those three individuals who have gone through written testing and oral examination and out of maybe 10 or 15 applicants, uh, hypothetically, uh, the list comes up of the three most qualified based on their scores, correct? That's correct. Uh, what then would you think when you, when you are given the opportunity, and hopefully you'll be given that opportunity to make a selection for promotion, what then would you be looking for that may make you think that number two is better than number one for the fit? Is it what you just mentioned moments ago? What is needed at that time? Uh, what kind of a manager for whatever particular void seems to be in the management ranks? Is that what you would look for or something else? That's correct. I mean, internally I would probably have a bias to going down the list because that's where the testing process has, has put people in there. But if there were a need and it said, and I'm looking for fit, as I said, if I had all operational people, you know, tacticians and at that a particular thing, and I needed some help in the administrative area, then I may look for someone who has has that skill set. Okay, uh, I, I don't have any additional questions. Thank you for your uh, response, Commissioner McCarley. And then I think uh, Matt had a no. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner. Sure, we're taking up a tremendous amount of time, but uh, Chief, I think what you're describing uh, with respect to promotions is the interplay between objectivity, which written test present as close as we can get to objectivity, meaning that there's hopefully very little variance and very little within those objective tests that could be deemed uh, discriminatory, that all the applicants for promotion to sergeant, lieutenant, or captain would in fact take this test, it's scored. Um, question from my perspective, do you score or uh, numeralize the performance evaluations, the annual performance evaluations as a basis uh, so that you banned uh, the officers uh, based upon that score. It's a cumulative analytical score based upon the performance evaluations during their tenure with the department. And then you combine that score with the objective, with the test. And only after those two components are summarized do you move into the area of subjectivity which we're discussing. I think, I suspect you're going back to military where you have. No, I'm going back to LAPD. Okay, or where some places have more of a numerical yeah. scoring. Our evaluations are not per se a numerical scoring. Depending on the testing process that's being run, the evaluations may or may not be considered in the actual evaluation process of which the chief is not a, is not a part. And so if it's not a part, then that would come into play at the, at the end of the process. Without or can, making any or comment, can come into play at the end of the process. Without making any comments, so the suggestion from Commissioner Devine is to increase, uh, to forsake the rule of three. I think it's within our province perhaps to suggest something to the council if that's the consensus of the commission. It's too early to even discuss that. But that would expand the number of individuals to whom or before whom uh, they would present, uh, present their credentials and you would have this broader pool to select from. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, again, is sort of dependent on how you see those candidates and how you see those candidates as the appropriate fit for a promotional opportunity. 
Yeah, I mean, and the rule of three doesn't bother me. In, rule in of six a, wouldn't rule bother of, you. Rule of six wouldn't bother me. The only all. interesting piece about that, which could create issues regarding possible discrimination, is that the moment that you start expanding the pool, you have six, eight, then there's a tremendous, if you look at the chief's selection process, that is fundamentally subjective, meaning the chief is making an assessment across the department, and that is who is appropriate based upon his command perspective for a particular position. If he has six, by golly, he has a lot of people, some of whom might have scored way lower than uh, the individuals at the top of the band. So That's what I said. The rule of three doesn't bother me. You know, look, as a manager, you always, we, always enjoy choices, but the rule of three does not, uh, I don't believe, handicap. Uh, well, I guess the real question is, if we give you a rule of six, we give you more candidates you against more you, candidates. which you make a decision. Let me, let me just, let me just uh, uh, kind of interject here for, for one second. Uh, the problem that I see with rule of six or eight or 12 or whatever you want to put in <laughs> is that, that that list expires at some point. So let's say if we have a rule of eight and we hire three from that eight, the other five are sitting around saying, how about us? <laughs> now the list expires after two years and now these people are saying, wait a minute, we're on the list, do we have to retake the exam again? Now you're gonna have more of a issue with a rule of six or eight because now you gotta have five or six people just basically having to retake the exam again because there's only three openings for a captain's position, for example. Uh, the three so on the top, well, I'm, I'm sorry. And as I said, all I can do is give you a perspective. Ultimately, I think that goes in your court as... So, uh, so that, that was my concern that if I'm number five on the list and all of a sudden the, the they are not making any positions available and the two year expires, now I'm gonna say, wait a minute, how about me? Why didn't you open a position for me if I'm number six for you to be able to hire me? Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Doyle, but I don't think that would make any difference uh, whether it's a rule of three or a rule of one. The list, if the list expires, it expires, and you retake the test. Right. That's if you're number you have more five, people on that list that expect to be hired. I think that's the... Well, they all expect to be hired. <laughs> and they, but there's, there's only a, three there's openings, a, There's so. a finite number of openings, and you could have a very large list, but whether it's a rule of three or a rule of six, you know, only three people are going to be selected off that list, so somebody's going to miss out. Um, but I, I think your point would be, gee, what if uh, numbers five, six, seven, and eight get selected and numbers one, two, and three get ignored? Uh, I wouldn't feel so great if I were not, uh, one, two, one, two, or, two three. or three. But uh, I mean, th these discussions have occurred many times over the course of my career. Uh, we've had... We've had task forces uh, that Ms. Farpetti even was involved in to look at the charter, and charter revisions and reform going way, way back. And uh, there are a lot of good arguments for modifying the rule of three. Um, and, you know, it's been brought forth uh, in those forums as well. We've had meet and confer with our employee associations and, um, you know, they have a perspective on, on it as well. But uh, I think uh, for, the, for the most part, I, uh, just the collective wisdom of all the people involved in those processes has been to keep it at, at three because it, uh, it seems like a reasonable uh, method of providing a little bit of flexibility, um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, en enough choices to, uh, to, uh, to provide to the appointing authority and uh, not a situation where you know, it often gets thrown out, uh, what if a what if a department head has a favorite, you know, their golfing buddy or the person that they go camping with and that person scores number 12 on the list and you skip numbers one through 11 and they pick the golfing buddy at number 12. That could happen if you, you know, expand the rule of three. So I think the position that our, uh, our associations have taken as we've engaged in the meet and confer on this issue several times that I can recall has been that they, uh, they do like the rule of three, it, it, it recognizes, you know, excellence in, you know, in the, in the selection process and who, who earns that high score uh, on the basis of merit. And uh, yeah, again, this discussion has occurred many, many times and it's always come back to, to uh, the rule of three being just, uh, you know, the, probably the best option. That's not to say it's, it's, you know, it's not the be all and end all. And, and 
the examples I was giving to you earlier about these unclassified processes that we're able to do, which have greatly assisted our, at least the acceleration of hiring of cops, that's been a, 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 an essential uh, a benefit to us. But uh, on all the other processes that we do that are covered under a classified civil service system, the rule of three seems to work okay. Uh, so I just have a, uh, first of all, let's hear from the association because I think they have some input on this. Both, both of you, if you want, it's up to you. Uh, so let's hear from the association on the on this discussion. Thank uh, you. Uh, and I have a comment. I, I stole the, uh, the ball from Ben here because I was the president of the POA when the rule of three discussion came up. But if I could address uh, Commissioner Devine's uh, points here uh, in, in two part. Uh, the first being uh, that there is an inaccurate representation of the department through the uh, ranks uh, at sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and above. Uh, it, it may ease some concerns here if, if we accept a few basic facts. And one is that our department was not as diverse 15 years ago as it is today. I think that's fair to say. We saw it in the stats just going back to 2007, but just like 50 years ago to today, it was not diverse. We're much more diverse today than we were 10 years ago, much more diverse than we were 20 years ago. So when you see the numbers of how many Armenian officers we have or how many Hispanics or how many Asians, it doesn't tell you their tenure. And so when we have made a, a concerted effort for these bilingual lists and we've done these things and we've added uh, more uh, officers of different ethnicities to our ranks, it takes a while for them to gain that tenure to even be eligible for those positions of promotion. What we have seen in recent years uh, is individuals being promoted that otherwise were not represented at those ranks and we've seen that happening and it happens over time. We can't go out and hire uh, 10 Armenian officers and 10 Koreans and the very next day have more Armenian officers uh, at the lieutenant rank or Koreans at the, at the lieutenant rank. And so when you indicate that there's a, not a level playing field or somehow that this is a problem that needs to be solved, this is a problem that starts in the recruiting process that we've seen. The department is getting more diverse. But it takes time for those people to work their way up the ranks, and I think that if we were to compare the numbers between now and 15 years ago, you'd see that our, our sergeants, lieutenants, captains, and above have been more diverse than we were back then. So it, it's a, a long process where the, the people that we're hiring now and the, the diversity efforts that have been made in recent years where we've seen uh, vast improvements, it takes a while for those people to work their way up the rank. We don't typically promote to somebody to sergeant until they've got roughly 10 years in the job, sometimes a lot more. Uh, lieutenant sometimes a great deal longer than that. So it's going to take a while, but eventually you'll see that the diversity efforts made in recent years, 10, 15 years from now, will play out through those ranks. Um, but the reason I, I was uh, wanting to address this with the rule of three is that the, the very issue that caused such a turnout and such a concern with our membership to come here tonight uh, is that uh, in, in asking this discussion that there's not a level playing field in representation through the ranks, um, asking uh, the interim chief here, hey, if, if you had a larger selection and you had a person of ethnicity group ranked one and a person of ethnicity group ranked three, and those were your exact uh, words in that scenario, would a greater selection of light? That's why my members were here tonight. None of them want to be known as having been skipped, passed over, or reached for on a list because of a demographic they check a box on, because that's a stigma they will have to carry with them uh, throughout their career that the chief made an exception or didn't take people in the order that they finished in the process because somebody perceives that the, the playing field is not level. The playing field is the playing field. The scoreboard doesn't represent if it's a level playing field or not. It's the administration of the rules and the umpiring that takes place. And uh, when we have that discussion and I'm sitting here and I hear this and, and everything that we'd heard up to this point was very reassuring, but we hear a discussion about, hey chief, if we did something, could we then get uh, something to balance this out or whatever? Absolutely, if we, if we made it to where the, the chief had the, the rule of eight or something along those lines, we could very easily cherry pick people based on things other than merit. And that is something that our, our members and our board and everything uh, caused us to come here tonight because we care about merit. And that applies to the officers who would benefit from that. Uh, the people who reached out to us when this discussion came up said they don't want to be known as someone who got something on anything other than merit because it's a long career and it's a stigma you can't shake and we don't wanna see this five years down the road where we start looking at groups of officers differently because they were either promoted or hired on something other than merit. So that, dis that discussion on the rule of three or rule of eight is absolutely applicable. We've had that discussion on whether or not the subjectivity of the chief's decision uh, is suited with three. Maybe it would be better suited with five or six uh, so long as 
there are legitimate, and unfortunately it's subjective at that position, but legitimate job-related, merit-related concerns, or even fit concerns with the management team when you get up to that rank, uh, that are the reasoning for having that subjectivity at that rank. Uh, so it's something that we've discussed and we've looked at, it's come up before. Um, we have no issues with the rule of three. We think that for the most part, the department traditionally has taken people by merit in order of rank, but when we start to have a discussion about an unlevel playing field or an inaccurate representation and utilizing those tools and that subject subjectivity to further an agenda is the very reason we had a turnout here tonight and it causes us gra grave concern. Uh, and that's it. Hey, right. Let's turn. Go ahead, please. Uh, let's turn this around then. Let's say, uh, and I agree with you that uh, they should be promoted on merit. I think sure. that's, uh, we're talking about a merit system. That's a civil service system. What if we do away with a rule of three and whoever finishes based on the oral interviews and the exams with their final scores, uh, the number one person gets picked number one. There's no subjectivity. They just, they're promoted if they finish number one based on all these tests and there's no rule of three. In an ideal world, that could work. Uh, unfortunately, there are often situations where you have uh, perhaps an internal affairs investigation that's not shared with the oral board. Uh, you may have a, another issue, personnel issues with the person that the oral board has no knowledge of. And so sometimes those things play into the, that subjectivity at that rank. Here I am, the, the uh, former president of the POA defending the chief subjectivity and who he promotes. <laughs> Uh, lightning will strike here shortly, but we understand that there are factors that, that take place at that level, and we've had trust in our recent chiefs that, that those factors are very, very important, closely held uh, reasons to not go in order, and they're only employed uh, in very rare circumstances and very judiciously. If we were to see uh, perhaps that uh, th that subjectivity was being abused or, or, or misused for political agendas or political pressure exerted on the chief, we would have an absolute problem with it. But unfortunately, there are reasons at that rank, at, that, at the chief's desk, where he may have reasons to have some subjectivity. And we understand that, we accept it, we've never fought the rule of three as a result, because there are things that aren't disclosed to an oral panel, and when you bring in a community panel or somebody else who, who blindly sits and listens to answers provided by candidates, they have no historical organizational knowledge of the candidates. That's stuff that the, a chief who's been around for a while has access to that is very important to fit and very important to the success of the organization. Anybody can give answers to an oral panel. Uh, we see that all the time. People pass our oral, oral interviews and then later turn out to fail out of the academy. They gave great answers at one point in the process, but down the road something didn't work out. And fortunately, the, the chief's office has uh, knowledge at that level that they sometimes employ in that subjectivity. So ideally in a world where all of those things got aired out in the process, job performance evaluations, internal affairs investigations, uh, other issues that aren't disclosed to the oral panel, if those things were somehow all put on the table, uh, including uh, you know, a person's fit within the organization or something like that, we might not need the rule of three, but those things were all withheld from the panels. That, and as a result, we know that those things sometimes have an effect on, on an individual's success uh, at a higher rank. Oh, okay, I thank think you. I hear you. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead, please. I think I hear you saying then uh, is that uh, it's okay for the chief to be subjective and uh, pick a candidate or do a promotion uh, not necessarily based on merit. So assuming that the merit is where they finish on the, you know, you said the, you prefer to take number one as number one, number two as number two, and that's based on the objective testing criteria. Likeliness so, to succeed or so other factors what, that so are, I'm, I'm sorry. So what I'm saying, well, I think I'm trying to understand your position because I'm hearing on one side you're saying merit and I agree with you. On the other side you say it's okay for the chief to be subjective and pass, possibly not go by merit and pick number three instead of number one who finished at number one. Sure. If, if every factor that went into a candidate's success and their ability to perform a function could be quantified into a score, and that was called merit, I would say it would absolutely be 100% merit and you should have no subject, subjectivity. But unfortunately, some aspects of merit, a person's work history, their ability to get along, to deal with conflict, to handle personnel issues, there are a number of issues that are important at those higher ranks. They can't be quantified, but there's still merit. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kazari, go ahead. No, 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 make your comments. I'll be uh, my, 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 my question to follow, and I'm asking the uh, Chief, thank, thank you. Uh, 
Is there a possibility, and I don't know what the answer is, maybe Mr. Dooley can tell me. Is there a possibility somebody could make the rule of three? Be number one in the rule of three. And then there is two job openings, and number two and number three get it. And then number one, who's been ranked number one, then doesn't get anything yes. until the list expires. Yes. 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 That is possible. There is a possibility that could possible. happen. Theoretically, yes. yes. For his discretion. Okay. His subject. Can I now add now? Then that that now, comes right into what I have to say. I wanted to do that because he slipped <laughs> me a five. So go ahead, <laughs> Mr. Terry. Uh, all right. I, I have a two-pronged inquiry and a question. One to you, Chief, and one to uh, uh, my dear friend, Jason Ross. The first one is... Uh, when you have, you've been around for a long time. At what point in time do you recall that there were more than three lieutenant position openings at the same time? It has been rare. I think we just, now I'm trying to, you have me reaching back as to whether we just promoted three lieutenants, but we did just, uh, within the last six months, we promoted 14 people in one shot. I think it was three lieutenants. So your lieutenant right, list. But, but that, is, that, that is unusual for our organization. Normally it is a smaller number. But the lieutenant list, the eligible, qualified, merit-based list, had a one and two and three. Right. And you promoted one, two, and three? Is that what, what happened? I believe so. Okay. Uh, and when you promote one and two and three and the list is alive. Let me, let me just, let me just. Uh, yes. Preface it. it might not be one, two, or three. It might be three, one, two. Yes. Or it might be a combination of that. You, right. You're just saying the yeah. three were yes. the three were promoted. Okay. And it may not have gone in order. Yes. In the, on my the question, list. my qu yes, I, I recognize that because I've mentioned a couple right. of right. times right. already. You go right. two, three, one, right. etc. Exactly. So we're past that. At least I am. Uh, so my question is, if the if the list is live, and it's a it's valid from my experience in what two years these lists usually uh, yep. stay alive. Typically, yes. Okay. So the person that is number four on that list on that test came in number four um, and the person that came in number five and the person that came in number six do these people now become the new one two and three or no yes they do okay so so i guess i guess the way i put that you have let's say you have one opening you'll get three names and then when you fill that opening you get another three names you get the top three names for every opening on so if you have two of those are repeats some. okay so you have one two three and you promote number two does number four then become the new number three, and Correct. the number three goes to number two, and the number one that wasn't selected remains number one on that list? For your hypothetical, yes, that's Correct. the way it would, right. would work out. Okay. Uh, so the three that are selected are the one, two, three that are classified as one, two, three. They're classified as such because they scored the highest in their written, they, they impress the most in their oral, right? And now you have a, a platter with three names. You then, uh, as the opportunity hopefully will present itself to you, you then will go about looking at which one fits best the need that you have at that particular time for the department that has the opening, whether it's a sergeant opening, lieutenant opening, or a captain opening, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, that's all I wanted to know from you. I want to ask Mr. Ross, the GPOA's uh, position that I just heard, and and, uh, and and Sergeant Ross, you know, we were on the same page too until you uh, decided having this dialogue with Commissioner Devine, and now you lost me for a minute. Sure. So I want to see if I can find you or you can find me again. I've never been cross-examined by you uh, before. I'm looking forward to this. This is not a cross-examination. <laughs> it would be different. <laughs> I'm not treating you as a hostile witness. There is no hostility here. Uh, you said that, uh, you said two things. You said job performance and internal affairs investigation, things that are not public that may come into play when the chief makes a selection from the list of three, and therefore, if, and, and, and I didn't 
get the sense that you are in favor of a list higher than three. I'm not either, for the record. I think three is a sufficient number of people for a chief to pick one from or two from, because I don't think at any given time management level would have more than three. And if they do, then the four, five, and six will move up, and, and it'll take care of itself. Yes, the GPUA's traditional stance in recent years is that we believe the rule of three accomplishes what it needs to accomplish. All right, so we're in agreement on that. So far, so good. My concern is this. When, when Commissioner DeWine talks about a purely objective standard so that there is no question ever raised by anyone that, oh, I wasn't treated fairly, or oh, so-and-so wasn't looked at objectively, and was in fact looked at subjectively, and the person's ethnicity or non-ethnicity caused them to promote or not promote. Huh? Uh, this concept of job performance and internal affairs investigation is where you lost me, because if there is such a, such a component, which uh, there ought to be, I have no issues with that. A job performance is indeed a component of someone's eligibility or suitability. An internal affairs investigation, if it's a live investigation, I sure hope that you or the department would not qualify someone to sit for a test while there's a pending investigation. Because that's kind of, that kind of is an exercise in futility. That's like promoting a police sergeant who's being prosecuted in a criminal case, except it's been, he or she is being prosecuted with the internal affairs. So I don't know if that's the case, but let me finish and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hear uh, from you gladly. I think a job performance and internal affairs investigation, that really sounds to me like looking at someone's personnel file and their history with the department and their tenure, as you labeled it earlier in remarks to Commissioner Devine. And that's appropriate. That is appropriate. But you can grade that. And, and maybe the solution and the answer is to place all of that in the grading because I don't want to put words in Chief Ross's, uh, the Chief, uh, Chief Ross, I mean, <laughs> Chief. we have Captain uh, Gilkerson, Chief Ross, uh, and Super Chief Povolaitis. Uh, I, I thought I heard Chief Povolaitis say that, um, and, and Chief, you can correct me, I, I don't know if I heard you correctly or not, but I thought I heard that um, when, when Commissioner Devine was talking about, do you look at the person's job performance in the past, or was it Commissioner McCarley? I heard that no, that is not something that go, gets, goes into it. Because I, I don't know that that should go into it at a stage where somebody's on a list already. Because if they're on a list, they're on the list and it ought to be based on their written exam uh, score, based on their oral exam score, and based on some other component that addresses their performance as a peace officer for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, which includes whether or not they've ever been disciplined, they've ever been reprimanded, they've ever been suspended, they've ever come before the commission, uh, and the commission has reversed uh, perhaps a, a chief's ruling in the past, whatever the case may be. So what is the GPOA's position in terms of uh, any likelihood of making it, and I hate to use the word appear, but making it be even more airtight so that poor, perhaps economically poor, but poor Chief Povolaitis down the line when he makes a selection, someone's not going to come and say, you know what, he didn't pick me because, because uh, I, I, you know, he didn't like my last name or he didn't like the complexion of my skin or whatever. That's so, it. so we, we, we don't have an, an official position on a slew of ideas. We are open to the discussion if the, the Civil Service Commission would like to look at perhaps quantifying a score for job evaluations. It's not something that we've done traditionally, uh, but job performance evaluations in some other agencies is given a numerical score. We don't have a numerical system here for job evals, but if there was a way to quantify that, perhaps. Uh, the GPOA would be open to a discussion with uh, a look at how the panels are constructed. Uh, we. we have typically found in the past that the best results come from a mix of uh, a, a broad variety of sources for these panels. Uh, if you provide uh, internal perspective on these panels, then you're typically going to get some aspect of job performance or some of the internal historical knowledge regarding the candidate uh, coming out in that process. And if that's somehow uh, 
done through the accomplishment of, of the, the community panel or the internal panel or however maybe we're open to those discussions and looking at uh, that thing. The IA uh, scenario, I'll go back to that real quick. Uh, it's my understanding that there is nothing that precludes uh, an officer, sergeant, lieutenant for, to apply for a higher rank with an open internal affairs investigation. There's nothing in the process. It could be not even disclosed to the person that they're being investigated at a, at a specific date and time. Uh, or they may know that it's being investigated, but until it's been adjudicated through the process, it may not uh, preclude them from participating in a promotional process. So there are things that are held at that chief's level uh, that fortunately in recent years, we've had a great deal of trust that those things that are held for that one tiny aspect of subjectivity are applied judiciously. Uh, and the only, the only issue we have with that, and frankly, the, that little bit of subjectivity has been so sparingly applied to the process, and it has typically been uh, in cases where the organization recognizes uh, some of the reasons or may identify with some of the reasons of why it occurred. It, everybody knows everybody across the street. Um, it's so seldom employed uh, to go out of order that it has not really created a, an issue that we have seen where that subjectivity may cause us some concern over what's taking place. One area that it will cause concern, if it ever was to come to life, is when uh, a chief, whether it's Chief Kovalaitis or a previous chief or, or a chief 20 years from now, has a, has, a, has a list of three people, but because of these factors that you've identified now, uh, thinks that neither one of the three are qualified the list dies because the chief, whoever the chief may be, is unwilling to promote any one of these three because of these uh, not made public issues. Uh, the, the list dies and the person who is sitting number four, who probably is exceeding standards, but there were three others that were exceeding standards and scored better, but had, had uh, skeletons in their closet, to put it, to put it bluntly. Uh, now the list died, and, and meanwhile, guess who suffers? You know who suffers. We suffer. The city suffers because we will we will be missing one lieutenant or one sergeant or one captain. We will be missing that position. Yeah, and and that scenario, uh, years back, there were vacancies that uh, weren't being filled, and there was an active list uh, was addressed by the bargaining unit with management. It resulted in the promotion of individuals. We also have five fabulous people that donate their time to ensure that there's fairness in this process. And I'm confident that if we got to a situation where there were vacancies and the chief simply didn't like the top three candidates that came out and decided he wanted to uh, game the system that you all would be willing to hear the issue and would uh, examine it fairly, taking into consideration whatever the perspective is of the chief and of the bargaining unit and the affected employee. I, I have that trust that this system would uh, help prevent that. I wanna thank Jason Ross for complimenting me. He said five fabulous people. I will stop at that. Thank you. I forgot. Yeah, I forgot. Matt email and just bring a lot of people who didn't pay attention. Five and I'm the six, perhaps. Okay. Uh, there was one more question. Yeah. One more comment. Let me just put a uh, nail on this one. Please. As far as I'm concerned, please. <clears throat> I appreciate what you've said. I appreciate your points. Uh, I brought this up about an hour ago <laughs> because I. I have concern about the, the uh, demographics by rank. Uh, from your comments, you do not have a concern. You think everything's okay, and you gave some very logical reasons why uh, you're not concerned about it. But I still feel that there, there's something here that needs to be looked at. What I wanna say, though, is that I am not, and I underline not, advocating to do away with a rule of three, to change anything. All I'm doing, and the only reason I brought this up tonight was for a discussion, a lively discussion, which we had. I don't want to see a letter come out from GPOA tomorrow saying that Commissioner Devine is advocating the change to rule of six or change the, the process that will uh, hurt the GPOA membership. So I'm going to get this on the record. I'm not advocating for anything tonight. I am merely bringing up points for discussion based on my perspective. I respect your perspective and perhaps my colleagues will be able to uh, work on this together and come up with something that may, if, assuming they feel that this needs to be looked at, the, the promotional uh, demographics, uh, perhaps we can discuss that in the future. But nothing has been said tonight that will change anything. So I just want to get that on the record. 
I appreciate that. Sure. And, and if you would like our perspective on any future discussions, uh, specifically regarding demographics and promotions, we would be happy to, to show up and give you some of that perspective. We'd also be happy to ask some of our uh, recent promotees to come here and, and share their experiences with the promotion process uh, and their perspective. Uh, I've promoted to the rank of sergeant. I think the process was fair. Sergeant Bateman, who's the president of the POA, has done the same thing. Uh, I don't think that we've had, certainly you folks would know if uh, any of our members had a concern, but we're like the complaints department as well. Uh, we would know if our members had an issue with the, the promotional process and the uh, demographics of the, the higher ranks. Uh, to date, I don't know that we have an issue, but we'd be more than happy to bring forth some members to share some of their personal uh, perspective on the issue because I know that it's something that uh, they are very passionate about. This commissioner would very much appreciate that. Thank you. In, uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna make a comment here from the uh, from the chief, and then we're gonna go to the next item because unless if you guys want to sleep here, I just wanted to make one comment because I think it's very appropriate uh, as far as I'm concerned. I will do what's fair to every employee in the city of Glendale. Bar none, I will not discriminate against any one group or any one person. Regardless of the pressure put by anyone or any organization inside and outside of the city of Glendale, I will do what's right for the employees of the city of Glendale and I will stand fast no matter how much pressure is put on us from anyone from outside. And I, knowing my commissioners, I personally believe that they feel the same way. And because of that, you have people here that are not open to uh, pressure from outside, from any organization, from any individual, uh, and from anyone. So I just want to make that very clear that we don't, we're not swayed by uh, organization numbers. We will do what's fair for the employees of City of Glendale, period. Uh, Chief? And it'll be a very brief comment just to confirm Jason Ross. We would not disqualify somebody because of the subject of internal affairs investigation. Obviously, anybody can file a complaint at any time, and it may be utterly without merit, and so we would not some, stop somebody from going through the, the testing process, uh, and that wouldn't come up in a, in a testing process. And then just as you're having your discussions to consider that and when we talk about this, I'm going to tell you, as I told you, Glendale Police Department, very bright people in the department, promotionalists, very bright people taking the test. Tenths of points, tenths of points can separate the top the top people from one, two, and three. So you're not looking like, oh, that got 100 and that was an 80. It can be literally 99, you know, 98.9. So, you know, that's part of the, the mix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, I wanted to also commend the uh, human resources. We put a lot of pressure on human resources to give us data. And God knows this commission probably more so than some of the uh, previews and now uh, we have asked for a number of items, both from our city attorney's office and from human resources. And there has never been once where they've said, you know what, you're just asking for too much or there's too much work to be done to do this. And every single time they come in, come in with just an extraordinary amount of information for us to digest. And I wanted to congratulate uh, Mr. Doyle for just a job well done. Uh, with that, can we get the next item, please? Reports? Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chair, uh, the, only re <laughs> the only report we have is a note and file. Uh, Mr. And Chair, our... could we interrupt the fact that these fine folks are vacating? Yeah, we appreciate that your be time. a comment on the subject of interest to them. Yeah, we, we appreciate you coming in tonight. We, we really do. Um, that's done. Uh, uh, next item, please. Move to adjourn. Oh, I, have one, I have one comment. I would like to adjourn tonight's uh, meeting in memory of an incredible employee of City of Glendale, uh, Hassan Haghani, who mm -hmm. passed away just oh, last week. Yes. And mm -hmm. I wanted to close tonight's oh. meeting just recognizing his contribution to the city and what he meant to the city and what he did. So with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Silence. Adjourn. Yeah. What do you mean? He died? Christmas morning.